Hello sports fans, welcome back. Another episode here of Moving Needle Podcast. If you're new to the show, thanks so much for downloading. Hope you push that subscribe button and follow so you don't miss a show. Very excited, Mr. Oscar Seitz, who campaigned on the World Cup circuit, maybe the previous generation. Um, I know him very well when I was on the Giant Factory team because he was our technical coach, but he was a lot more um, successful downhill rider in his own right, riding in the heyday. I'm going to pick his brain, you know, alongside some greats, David Vasquez, Kurt Vores, um, on the Volvo Cannondale team. So um, I'm really excited because we've personally got some good stories that I hope we remember of when we worked together of coach uh, and athlete at the top of the hill. I know you've got some hilarious ones that I quote all the time, but Oscar, enough from me. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for having me moving the needle. It's a, it's a pleasure being here with all you guys. Yeah, man. Um, shucks. But I mean, people have probably seen you on the side of the track and, and you've been working with some incredibly big stars, um, lots of riders. I, I read their testimonials, but maybe we need to go a little bit more back in time to catch the listener up. I mean, you raced downhill and rode a bicycle from super, super young in, in Spain. What What was it like? back then growing up i think you went to trials mountain biking before mountain biking was a thing yes 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 i grew up uh so i grew up i always liked bikes so i think at the age of three or something i got you know the first bike like every little kid might get one so i was young it was only three and then my father was like kind of pushy always so it's like no you know no side wheels or no you know the little 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 kids they have little oh, training wheels, wheels. wheels training wheels so no training yeah. wheels. So I, I never had the pleasure really riding training wheels. So he pushed me right away riding the bikes. And then I, I, I remember the first time um, he was a fan of trials, motorcycle trials. So uh, he was the one that brought, you know, took me there, uh, get to see the scene once and immediately got hooked big time. Uh, I saw my, you know, motor trials idols back then. So, we, I mean, we're talking like mid, late 70s. And, and then not, not, I mean, only a few years after they created bike trials around, you know, around, you know, in Spain, but especially in my region where we always uh, lived. And, uh, and then the, the opportunity to actually be riding on something that was not on a motorcycle. So it was actually like cheaper, was a bicycle. And the first competitions immediately started right after. And I was... I was definitely hooked by 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 trials, which I think I think for me was always like a great school. It's a great school that has me actually allowed me to to be not only creative, but it's also to for me to be always helpful to dissect the technical movement in any discipline, but also to create the drills to actually improve that technique. What do you think? Now with your job, right now you're still using some stuff you learned back then with the trials outlook on it. Yes, yes. It's not like exactly the way I learned it because it was like a lot, a lot of self learning. But because of a lot of self learning, and we were a, a bunch of like kids that actually grew up in bike trials that we were experimenting. Self self learning was was a thing. You know, you you come up to a race and then all of a sudden you hop over a rock a different way that everyone was doing it or somewhere else will be doing it. So we were actually like developing, evolving, always like growing, always changing. And, and that actually gave me the opportunity to, to, to be not only creative, but also be really analytical and analytical. And then, and then, uh, so I, yeah, I grew up in trials, BMX as well. Uh, I think I raced 10 years about trials and then another probably four or five only seasons of BMX before mountain bike was a thing in Spain. So then it's like, we're talking like uh, late seventies to the very beginning of the nineties, probably 90, 89 or 90 was the first time I saw a mountain bike, 88, 89, I saw one. It's like, well, this is like a road bike, but it's got really, you know, it's, it's got like off-road tires. And, but that was like way, way later. But the first stage was like trials and BMX. So I was doing trials on a motorcycle at age five, but also on a bicycle. So both ways were kind of like parallel and I grew up there. That was my background and BMX was added to that. So a lot of the weekends were Saturday afternoon BMX and then Sunday was trials. 
That's awesome. And uh, what was your first memory of, of a mountain bike? I mean, we're showing our age. I also got on a fully rigid mountain bike for the first time. And you can imagine the youngsters listening to this. They'd laugh. I mean, some of their first bikes are dual suspension or they somehow get a downhill bike for the first time if they live near a ski resort. You know, they might not even have ridden a hot. Some people might not ride a hardtail unless you go dirt jumping this day and age. Absolutely. And now it's, he don't, I mean, he didn't have a chance back then. <laughs> you, yeah. Like when mountain bikes were like that. So I remember like first time I rode ones, um, uh, the place we used to live, so our, our, uh, our family house, we had a little side garage and then we will rent this side garage to a young couple. And this young couple will put the car in there and we'll put like a small motorcycle they used to have. But we had access to this garage from our garage. So I will always be like nosy and, and, and go in there and see if they had a new car or something like this. Um, and one of the days I, I went in and I saw this bicycle and I'm like, what is this? So I saw like a rice bar, uh, you know, this kind of like transmission looked like a road bike, but it had, you know, it had, you know, big off-road tires, thick tires. And I was really curious about that bike. So the first thing I actually, without asking permission, I went outside the street, took it for a little ride. And of course, the first thing I always did, and I, always, I still do, is like pop a wheelie on the thing. And it felt amazingly good because, I mean, 26-inch wheels compared to the 20-inch of trials and BMX. So it felt really nice. So wheeling up and down the street, manualing the thing, you know, doing stoppies immediately. And, and so that was the first time I actually get to ride a mountain bike. And I, I mean, I, I liked it to the point where my brother not you know not being as competitive as i was at, at trials he was not really interesting in racing and in competition he used to be my minder so we or my father bought him a mountain bike to actually follow me at trial so he will bring water and and some tools or anything i might need so th that's how slow they got into mountain bike but that was like very very late 80s yeah and i mean i look looking back at your career i obviously remember it when you're on these huge teams and uh, you and David, the two Spaniards, always on the podium. And But prior to that, you were racing like hardtails or uh, bikes with not great suspension on, on the world circuit. Like what, what was the transition like into the world stage for you when maybe you realized <laughs> I want to make a career of it? Was there yes. that decision or was it just total organic natural progression like doing a national – doing a European race and then the race is history. How does it, how did it look for you? It, it was a decision. So, you know, it was this mountain bike and then my brother's mountain bike. I will used to take it for a ride, get lost in the forest, came back, you know, whatever. And uh, a couple of years later, a friend of mine convinced me like, Oscar, this, this mountain bike race, why don't we sign up for this thing? I have already done a few. Absolutely no idea what was going to happen. I, I didn't know. I thought about it more like Enduro Foreman nowadays. That's how I picture mountain bike in my brain. So it's like, okay, that's going to be like this big bike. So imagine me showing up on baggy BMX pants, flat pedals, you know, whatever. My, my gear I used to race trials with. Um, so I show up there and then I see all these people like, you know, putting cream on their legs. I remember it was a rainy, after, a rainy late afternoon uh fall probably november and it was like this you know big loop 40k under the rain i did it i just came behind my friend obviously the first four or five k's i was in you know close to the lead only four k's and then it's like back and then struggling to finish the thing and i told him like don't ever call me again to do this thing <laughs> I was not prepared. I was not expecting. I was not trained for uh, endurance at all. So he, the same guy, called me like six months later. Uh, James called me back and says like, Oscar, now I really think this is your thing. It's called downhill mountain biking. It's like, what is this? It's like, yeah, it's short. It's all downhill. There is no endurance involved. You're going to love this thing. So I sh you know, showed up there. With my first bike, so same, so same guy that took you to an XC race same calls guy. you back, like so yes. you didn't even know the sport exists at this stage. No, no idea. Um, so I knew that mountain bike, the first national championship, already happened in Spain, but I didn't know about downhill. And so it's like, okay, that's gonna be like a regional race. It's downhill. We gotta show up, 
and and let's check out this thing and of course absolutely no clue showing up there with license signing up paying for registration and the race everyone already was shuttling and everyone had an idea on the course i walked up and then i raced down that's that was my that was my uh, baptism in downhill and i got second but i had this feeling where it's like that is what i want to do because he had a mix to me, we had a mix. He woke up, he woke up a mix, a, 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 a call in my inside that was like, this is a perfect mix between the technique on trials that I can really apply many things and the speed I always liked. So I always was a, spe- a big speed fan. I like the, I like the, to test the limits in, in, in speed, but this involved really technique skill. So it's like, I, I told him like, man, you nail it. I want to do this. I raised this on my first uh, uh, Nishiki Aerial. So that was my first bike. So I got into my brother's mountain bike. Then I bought this Nishiki Aerial uh, for the 91 season. So I raced only three, four races. The bike was a little bit small. So I decided to change the bike on the year after. So I bought a K2, same brand as skis. So it was a K2, it was a way bigger bike. Uh, both were hardtail originally, but at the Nishiki, the local bike shop, they saw like I was fast enough, so they decided to throw a front suspension fork. Really very innovative back then. I think Manitou had their fork, RockShock had they also their fork, which was like a black lowers. Manitou had the last summer ones. This was, was a Italian Forcella Springs, and so I raced this one in 91 and then 92, I raced completely uh, hardtail bike. So everything was hardtail in, 90, in 92. Then 93, I was looking for a sponsor somewhere. I needed help. I was like, I really want to race this. I want to take this serious. And then the first magazines always like, you know, they start to come the first magazines. And I start seeing that the first American stars. So I start seeing like Greg Herbal, John Tomac, you know, all, all these big you know, stars and mountain bike, all, all the icons were on the magazines. And I was like, I have to make it overseas. I, I want to do this professionally. And I really got like super focused to actually jump on a Alpine Star uh, sponsorship in 93. So the bike was a hardtail with a front fork. And then I would race. I, I, I won national, the first national title in 93. So I was a rookie. And then all of a sudden I show up to nationals, beat everyone. And then from there, you know, everything kind of like scale. So I decided to go, my, my, uh, my sponsor gave me like a, a bonus on an envelope and said like, Oscar, now you can go to World Cups. We will pay for it. And then I showed up to a couple of World Cups, which the first one was Capdale, super rocky, Roman way, sh- absolutely shocking. That was like, more than shocking, was like a big slap on the face. I would go there and then I look at, you know, Dave Collin and, you know, he was like a current world champion, Mike King, everyone, I mean, the Europeans, the fast European, the French is, um, Gachet, all those people, they had full suspension bikes. Nicolas Vouillot, full suspension bike. These brakes had nothing. And I thought like, it's like, I gotta beat those guys. I gotta, I, you know, I gotta make it. To me, it was like a, a train passing by and it's like, I gotta jump on this train. I saw immediately like, this is an opportunity. I, I somehow made it. So I was like 65th, I think, on the first World Cup. Then I showed up in Caprun. And I think I got like 22nd or 20th or something like this already in my second World Cup. And I was like, okay, this is going well. And then and then I got a full suspension bike the year after by Alpinester, 94. But the, so your bike was way crapper the first two races. Like these guys oh, yeah. were on factory gear. And, and for context, that track, because I've seen some footage, would you say that's Okay, obviously it's maybe not as flowy as the current track, but the roughness and length would be quite gnarly on today's downhill bikes, right? And you were back then, say, like yeah, that I, track seemed crazy. Maybe it, it it was crazy back then. Obviously, like the wheels were way smaller and no suspension. I mean, we're talking like the, the guys that had more, you know, suspension travel. Like the best suspensions were like four inch, four inch of travel. Yeah, and the casing and they of the had tires, a big advantage. Yes, but the casing of the tires, everyone would flat. Everyone was pumping tires, using double tubes inside. Um, you know, like I didn't have a chain device. So well, half the way down, my chain was off. Absolutely. So I had to like push a lot of the times my feet, you know, with the front derailleur, 
shifting down to shift up and put the chain back on. It's, it's, I mean, it has nothing to do uh, on like today's downhill is absolutely another world. Like to my first race, obviously that quickly evolved in '94. We all had uh, full suspension bikes. These brakes were still in the transition. Some people would have these brakes, some others won't, or opted for V brakes. But then it's like, I think it's like 95, to, to me it was like 94, 5, and 6, the bikes were evolving. So double crown was already 96. So the best guys would, you know, Rockshock had a double crown, Manny too had a double crown, everyone. And then to me, the evolution in downhill was really quick that first years. Up to where 98, 99, the bikes were like, I would say like already similar to the bikes nowadays. Obviously, shorter travel still, smaller wheels, and the equipment wasn't by far as good as they are now. If you look at suspension nowadays and what, how capable bikes are now and what happened back in the day, I mean, mechanical failures was a thing. You know, you had cartridges blowing up, you had flat tires, wheels collapsing, cranks snapping. I mean, you name it, everything, everything. So it was a, a huge test for, for, a, for product, huge test. Yeah, and you were definitely testing at the races because some things were failing and they had to sort of rapid prototype and you guys were modern day test dummies but at world cup level like now you shouldn't be testing anything really at a world cup you know and you can buy everything off the shelf like it's so different to back then like Absolutely. equipment made a huge huge advantage if you had the latest triple clamp before say someone that's coming out of spain you know then Yes, they have more experience, but the equipment's giving them a couple seconds on that race as well, or more. Yeah, so the, the thing was like being like a sort of like a satellite. For example, 95, 96, I was racing for a JVC, so the electronic components, audio, TVs, and all this. So they would sponsor the team. We had Gary Fisher, I remember. And I had two competitions going on when I would actually like sign up for a, for a World Cup. First, it was beat the factory guy. Back then was... Michael running yes. and, and Skull Shackles yeah, yeah, yeah. was a trek. So it's like, I got to beat those guys. I got to show them that with a way less capable bike, I can be the same speed. And then the other thing was like trying to break in top, top, top 20. I already had top 20 a couple of times. So it's like, okay, this year, 96, I need to be like in the top 10. And I had to somehow make it to the big teams. All the big teams were there back then. Almost all the big, I would say not all, but most of them were obviously uh, North American based and Norba was really big. So the national championship in the States were, was it was a really big championship. So, so for me, my eyes were already, already going overseas. 2024 is here in full swing and that means it's time for a new year's resolution check-in with our friends at Manscaped. Newsflash, it's never too late to level up your grooming game and keep your bush tamed. Manscaped's new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good, turn the page on confidence this year. Whether you're going for a trim or that clean shaven look, this trimmer has you covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide, now is your time to get a grip on your grooming with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code MOVINGTHENEEDLE for 20% off and free shipping. The ball has dropped. But don't drop the ball on your balls. Introducing the MVP of 2024, Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower. It's not just a trimmer, it's your grooming sidekick. We all want to shave time off our race runs, but how about shaving the parts that really matter? Picture this, you're shredding down the gnarliest trails, feeling the wind in your hair, and then it hits you. You need to tame the beast below the belt. That's where Manscaped comes in with a cutting edge technology and precision engineering. You can now groom with confidence, just like you conquer those downhill descents. And for my men who want the full grooming experience, look no further than Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0. In this grooming kit, you'll get the trusted lawnmower. And that's not all. Manscaped's ear and nose trimmer and the essential aftercare products with a crop soother, ball aftershave lotion, and crop preserver. Anti-chafing ball deodorant. Yeah, it's deodorant for your balls. I bet you didn't think you needed that. And folks, this isn't just any trimmer. It's got skin safe technology to prevent nicks and snags in those delicate areas. Seriously, I've been testing this bad boy and not one nick down there. It's waterproof so you can take it from the trail to the shower without missing a beat. 
constant motors like the turbo boost for your nether regions, ensuring you'll be flying down those trails in record time. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code MOVINGTHENEEDLE at manscaped.com. Embrace a new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer, courtesy of Manscaped. What um what was it like with your dad? You said your dad took your training wheels off. Well, it didn't allow you training wheels. What was it like when you talked about going pro and this is the mountain bike thing I'm going to do and sounds like you didn't go study then at that time. You just chased this mountain bike dream if I've got it right. Yeah. So I raced uh, trials was until I was like 17. So uh, pretty much my last year of high school. And then I had this kind of like this wild year and transition where it's like, okay, trials, I would not make it to professional level. Obviously at home, they didn't want to meet, buy enough motorcycles to make it to the top level of trials moto. So I left trials when I was like 15, uh, 16, probably moto. And I raced another couple of years on bicycle, but I, I had very clear that I was never going to make a living or a professional career out of bike trials. Um, so then immediately it's like that click. And then I saw, you know, the Americans and th them making a living, you know, uh, being professional. And I was like, that's a thing, you know? And, uh, I, I was, I was in university back then. So I was a, a law student and I was like actually doing both. So in the morning I would go, uh, you know, ride my bike a little bit and I would go in the afternoon, you know, a, a class at university to try to like do both. And that doing both, that duality lasted until my second year of Volvo Candle, where I thought, I was like, look, I'm traveling for five months a year and this is not sustainable anymore. So it's like, I better focus on sport now. I'm making a living out of this. Let's try to get the max out of the sport. And then I, you know, let's see what, what that, you know, how that carries on and, and what am I going to do? Obviously, I was 23, 24. I never expected I would race past 30. Absolutely never. I would be like 20, 21, and I would look at the masters back then being 30. And I was asking myself, like, what's these old guys doing here? You know, and they were 30, 31, 32, and I'm seeing them old already. So I never expected being racing over 30. Absolutely not. And what, um, so you got onto these, was that, what was the biggest first team you, you got on? Like, I, like was in, you know, in, like factory, factory team. So in 96, when I raised the uh, Gary Fisher, you know, uh, sponsored by, uh, team, it was JVC. The team decided to stop at the end of the year. And I, I thought like, okay, well, this is, you know, game over. It's either, it was, to me, it was like two ways. If this doesn't happen, I, I cannot, I, I don't get you know, interest for any team, it's, it's over because in Spain, the chances were, you know, very, very little chances, not many opportunities here. And I had to make it overseas. I had already a couple of seasons in the World Cup. Um, I had made some contacts and I was like, oh, hey, maybe, maybe someone remembers, like I've done some nice, good races with not good support, not good product at all. And I had this interest from Gary Fisher. And the guy that was actually helping us in Spain made some contacts internationally. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe they want you on the factory team. And the excitement was, you know, unbelievable for over a month. And back then, I mean, you can imagine there was no internet, no, no cell phones. So only fax, you know, fax email was the <laughs> way to communicate or the, or, or the phone. I would, you know, I would stay away because, uh, you know, I would receive from, from North America a, a fax and that would be like two or three in the morning for me. Tell me like, okay, Oscar, what about this? What about that? So we start having the first conversations up until at one point they decided to cut and they said like, mm, there's no place for you. We were interested, but, uh, you know, the usual thing, budget, not possible. And wow, the world crumbled. You know, I was, I was... I was so upset. I was like, okay, this is, this is the, this is the end of it. You know, I had to go, I would, I would have to go back hundred percent to university, become a lawyer, you know, and think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a professional career. I still kept on training when going to the gym, uh, really the swimming pool was a therapy. So I would go swimming and I would go like, I don't know, for 1500, maybe two kilometers swimming because that was a therapy. I had this noise of the water and back and forth and back and forth thinking like, man, 
I hope someone calls me. Who can I who can I talk to? Where can I go? I would pay, I would do anything to actually hop on that train. And far, you know, fair enough, I got a I got a, a fax from Volvo Canada. So all of a sudden, the best team back then, fax, is like, we're interested in you. We have the French Frank Roman, and he's not racing anymore. So we thought about you. And they thought about me because in Mount Saint 95, I stopped my frame in half. I went to a mechanical, somewhere, they, a, a car repair or something. That, he welded that frame for me, but obviously it was an aluminum frame. They welded it. It lasts for maybe like another minute and a half on course because obviously it was not heat treated or anything like that. And I had to go to Volvo Candle. I ended up racing on Missy Jovi's cross-country bike. So that was like a, a tiny little bike with barely any suspension travel. And I raced that bike. So they remember, you know, that Spanish kid, you know, being, you know, f- searching for, you know, help everywhere. So they send the fax. They said, like, I remember, I still remember that was like a, a Monday. And they said, like, if you want Thursday, you can go to the headquarters in Europe, in Switzerland back then for marketing. So I was there. And then I remember that day my father brought me to the airport. He was planned. He was going to pick me up in late afternoon, you know, my flight back from, from Switzerland. And then I came back with a contract in my hand with a duffel bag with gear. And I said, like, got this. So that was, it was the, that it was that crazy back then. Huh? You go yeah. hop on a flight, they do the contract because it's like in paper. There's no emails exactly. to like, yes. hey, look at the first draft. It's come to the office. No. Let's figure it out. The like old school, right? Old in front school. of each other. Yes. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. With and you class, come back on a plane with a contract and the gear to yeah. show your dad. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was like, then it was like, a, um, you know, we sit down there. It's like, okay, this is the racing calendar. Uh, you join in the team. Do you know any in the team? Well, you know how the team works. They will, they will, they will, you know, they will keep you posted. They'll give you a brief on how the team and everything. We talked about the money. So okay, wait a wait a minute. Pa, 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 pa. They type the they type the money into the contract. Was you know, print it, sign, get some gear. So I got some gear and went back home. And a week what are we later, talking? I, what are we talking money wise? You can talk about now, or is it too personal? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, I mean, like, the, fir- the first the first contract was uh, I think it was like a 35,000. 35, that's not the, bad for back then. And yeah, for the first like, contract. Obviously, I was like, I was, I was like, kind of cautious asking because to me, the most important thing was like, I, I know if 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 I get with 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 the big boys and I can actually have the good product, yeah. I'll I'll make a living. It was to me, it was like hundred percent. Yeah, it was an investment. The years before, already, like when I raced with the Spanish team, they they all, they were all also offering twenty five, thirty thousand, and I always said like, I don't care if I need to cut in half, but I want to do the whole walk up circuit. I don't want to yeah, race yeah, some, some of the walk, walk up events. I want to do a walk up, whatever, whatever is left of the money, I will get it. I want to race the walk up and I want to make, you know, the whole circuit. And I'm going to try to, to step up from where we are now, which is like satellite, you know, that kind of like the, I call it like the, the, the struggle line, right? So you see a lot of kids having this where it's like, whoa, they are like, you know, struggling with product with with support and they probably they have the talent and then it's what you need to like actually step it up and it's a wild step still is nowadays Mm. now i'm always interested because like not really the number but more how it happens you know especially old school like did they ask you for the number did they Mm. say we've got this budget like because you know, whoever speaks first, they say loses. But I think a good negotiation should be win-win anyway. And you winning because you want a factory team and support and, and they needed a rider. Yeah. I never I never thought about this. Like, I was sure. I had no idea what, you know, what the uh, real pros were making back then or if you had, like, a, a real good professional contract, how much would you be making? It's like, uh, you know, I, I didn't care at all. It's like, I, I you yeah, know, all I want to do is just, you know, be on a team like that and 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 try to see how far can I can I take this. Hundred percent. I mean, I didn't know either. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I got my first contract when I was at Fort William at the end of 05 with Mongoose for 06. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, and and they put the number in the paper. And and exactly, I just wanted a factory ride. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, so I was saying like it's yeah, I can I can relate because that's the goal, right? Getting factory support, someone paying for your flights, you don't have to work on your own bike. Like I was big borrowing and stealing getting to these races. Um, and that first car like it's just this relief, don't you think? That first first factory support. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and then of course like I uh, you know the, that was uh uh, I can't remember the month. I don't know if it was the very end of the year in 96 or was it the very beginning of 97? I believe it was at the end of 96, yes. So probably like November. So I had a couple months training home. And then at the end of January or like probably mid-February, I think, I would travel to the first training camp in Palm Springs. So for me, it was like the first trip. I also like started in Barcelona. And, you know, I was like on my own. Um, I had a nice story about this trip. So imagine like back then they send you like this, shit, you know, this, this stack of papers, this thick with all the plane tickets. Cause obviously I was going Frankfurt, Frankfurt, LA, LA, Palm Springs, and then back and all this. So to me, it was all absolutely all new. I had a manager before we would travel together, but the travel agency would do the work for us. So I was like, okay, now I have all this, this big wallet with all this, these plane tickets and everything. No, no idea. So I'm going to the airport. I get dropped by my father. Uh, he still drops me up at the airport now. Age 83, he still drives me to the airport nowadays. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I get dropped by my father. And it's like, I got stuck at security. So a safe control at the airport. And it's like, man, if I don't hurry, if I don't rush, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose. I'm going to miss the plane. And, and it's, you know, my... It's like if I if I miss the plane, then I miss the other one. So everything I had, you know, I was like completely like a little bit in panic. So leaving so fast, grabbing everything from security control, pop, 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 I forgot my belt. And then I had to make it to the airport running. So I make it to the first transfer to Frankfurt. And then on the way to the States, I'm like, I don't have a belt. And I had these jeans, they were kind of like a bit loose on the waist. So I still the uh, belt on the plane. So I stole the belt on the plane and that's like, maybe it was fashion a few years after or something where you have like this plane, it's a, you know, this, this, the seat belt on the plane is your belt. <laughs> but you just took one. Maddie, Maddie Lee coined and did that for a while. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. So I, he I, had, I was, but that's when it was fashion. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I, 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 I started like touching these things, you know, putting my thumbs inside. So I, I, I finally unclicked one of the sides and I was like, well, if I click the other side, <laughs> I can make this work because otherwise I have to like roll my pants like this, like a dancer. I didn't know what to do. So I was like, I cannot walk with my gear and then have my pants falling on my waist. So I stole, I, I stole those, uh, the seat belt and actually make a, a belt for my trousers back then. <laughs> Cause you're too scared getting to your first training camp with no belt and like, Exactly. <laughs> being the kid from Spain yeah, with yeah, no belt. Yeah, yeah, and you know, Euro, so, you know, back then it was like maybe in the states the baggy style was a thing, but not in Europe. So you had to put your pants, <laughs> you know, tight up to, up to your waist. That wasn't a thing in Europe. Yeah, there was some. It was good times. It looked, man, it looked exciting. I mean, those first few years. I mean, I can only relate. To, like, it's everything's new, exciting, but. You, you had some awesome results as well, right? You like got to the point where you're knocking on the podium, a lot of races in a season. Like, How cool is that looking back at, at some of these? Like, It's the heyday for sure, you know? I mean, it's obviously it's crazy exciting now. Um, it's not about the money, but the money sort of come back with the salaries and stuff. But like, you were in that big heyday before like um, it was a really a problem for teams and budgets. Yeah, and I, I think like ninety, yeah, mid nineties, definitely to the very late nineties, maybe the beginning of two thousand. That was like probably you know the best years back then. So you know, I start like figuring it out. It's like okay, well, if you get to to this, you know, overall, if you win this race, if you hop on the podium, then it's like I mean, look at the salaries, you know. And then it's like you also start thinking money, but that was like after probably. Probably my second year of Volvo Canon, not 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 the first one. The first was only about only about performing, and I I, I clearly remember that. I I sort of like think also like, obviously you have to think like financially it has to work for you, and then you, you, your your sports career is kind of like 
is short. If you compare to a lifespan, if everything goes right, of course, you're healthy. It's short and you, at one point you start worrying. It's like, okay, I need to be, I need, I, I like to buy a home. Uh, you know, I like to, to, to probably buy a car or, or, or do all these things. And then you need, you need that money. You start thinking at the financial level, but that wasn't not, not really important in the first phase. I, I think, I, I mean, I remember it very clearly in uh, 97 because I would race, uh, Norba almost all of, not all the circuit, I was half of it. And then the world cup. So every time there was a World Cup overseas, I would travel a week before. I would stay for a little bit. So maybe just race in Norway in, in the same period. I would fly for a World Cup. And in 97, I got uh, second at the Norba in Pittsburgh. Uh, Steve Pitt won it. And after the race, everyone would gather at Palmer's bus. Sean Palmer had this bus back then already the famous chrome silver bus exactly and i remember Sick. him like coming as you said you're coming from spain and a lot of people around the world have no idea you're coming from it's not, it's not a little country it's not, it's not so small but obviously they have no idea economically how what it is and etc etc so the thing like i remember palmer telling me like man you really had a good race today you got second and it was like only like a few tens of speed uh pd and uh Said so like, I mean, look at this bus. You know, if you make money racing mountain bikes, one day you can have one of these. So I, I clearly remember that. It's like, I'll try to make money. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll try to make money out of the sport. But it was like, that was a little bit like when I started waking up a little bit saying like, okay, maybe I can make a decent living out of this. Not just, you know, going, you know, uh, going paycheck to paycheck. And, yeah. uh, and probably then I start thinking more financially in the future, what what I you know was what what can I do etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah those, those well, years it's a were natural natural progression though you know obviously results like the better results everything takes care of itself but it seems like a few guys you would get together and talk salaries uh, and it's a weird sport I don't know if it's good or bad that the contracts are sort of legally binding that you can't talk about the salaries. I'm not sure if I agree or disagree with that. I was having a conversation with someone pretty high up and making big money, and, and I'm not trying to be personal about what people make. It's just every other sport almost, you kind of know the big prize money. You can see the Nike endorsements. Like You can only guess what the amount is, but in our sport, everything's quite closed off. But I know like Palmer and PD would talk, like business, like maximize this, you know, like – we're doing the job, we're the asset, we're risking our lives. You know, let's maximize this short career span. I wonder two things, like did you have people you could talk to and bounce ideas off later on? And then do you think it's something that would be good to open the doors and let the salaries out? I, th I, think, I think it's let the salaries out. I absolutely, I think nowadays who, who has more access knowing the numbers are probably the team managers. Because as a team manager, yes. you know, or, or you know, up, up until now, when I was at the downhill team, I would talk to writers. And you, 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 can, you, can, you can talk numbers with other people. Obviously, you, you keep it sort of like confidential. So if I know that Andrew is asking for this match or Andrew's price is at this level and then someone else is at that level, blah, blah, blah. But you have an idea once you've talked to, you know, the, the, the eight, ten writers where everyone, you know, might be moving. There's two ways in the past that they actually like, because the, some of the writers, they, they would try to like push the numbers up and make more money. And it's either that like, they actually like, kind of like lie in what they make. So I would come to negotiate to you, Andrew, and say like, ah, you know, this match, they, you know, I'm making this match. So I'm only going to leave if, you know, it's a, if it's a noticeable increment in, in salary. Um, so that's so that's one way, you know, telling like you're making more than you what you're really making, and then probably you get, you know, you get you get the higher price, and the the other thing was, I mean, done maybe not in the best way, a, a very rebel way, but what Palmer was doing, Palmer was trying to get mountain bike because I had the chance to actually like, you know, share a couple of years of racing with him and specialized, and he was trying to compare us with the motocross guys. And that game, I knew it because, for example, like I had 
good friends that back then was running the GP circuit. So the MotoGP guys in the GP circuit, like the 250s and the 500s back then, uh, they were actually trying to, for them, the, the difference to Formula One to them was a huge difference, a huge step. They were making very good money, but the Formula One was, was something way, way, way above. And, uh, and uh, for me, Palma was the same example. Mountain bike, at that point, they were making very good money. I mean, we, we're talking 25 plus years back, but the motocrossers were making a lot more money. So when he signed with Fox, he was trying to get them to pay the same as the motocrosser. Uh, and he was trying to actually get those increments in salary. I think not only for him, he was pushing everyone to ask for more money. That's what I heard, uh, to, like, to, to, to look money. after yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And and nowadays, a company like Fox, I, I mean, don't, I guess, it's not fact, but I'm hearing the numbers in mountain biking, sales units and turnovers, quite impressive, even compared to motocross. But then a motocross championship bonus is crazy money, you know, from Fox. And they're paying rocks and crazy money, you know, like, so I guess Manar's on Fox now and Bruni was, and it's like, yeah, I don't think mountain biking caught up enough. And that's, that's cool to hear that. I think on, on, the, on the late 90s, I think it was good. And then we had like a everything um, sort of like went down. And the salaries, you know, we all had to go down in salaries. So in the late 80s, you know, you were making like already like good money. Then it's like all of a sudden you would go down. Uh, but you guys and, had outside industry sponsors, which really helped back then, like the Volvo, the Mountain Dew on Specialized. So that now, we don't have a lot of that. Uh, like no. What, I mean, what team has an outside industry sponsor that is obviously basically just a big cash payment? It's not just parts and money. Yes, like, I think um, in downhill we don't you have, have a lot you, of that. No, no. You have doorball in downhill. You have you know a couple in in XC, but you don't. Um, yeah, XC you, a little bit more. Yeah, you don't have not like huge. yeah, like like before. And if you look, for example, like at at the at the small you know a small sport like like cyclocross, they always have outside sponsors. If you look at road cycling, they have the outside sponsor. So I think, I think to me it's like how or at the beginning. If you look, because in downhill everyone always likes likes to look at the. I don't say it's a mirror, but it's kind of like a reflect on the motocross industry. If you look at the motocross, you know the Americans they put the races at the stadiums, and that goes up because everyone who's watching this is a big show, and obviously moves a lot of money. And that is where you know if you wanna if you wanna get paid big money. The sport needs to be popular. It needs to have a lot of spectators, viewers, t you know, people following on TV. When this gets big, then this, obviously this, this, you know, you, you're going to uh, get a lot more money, attention, and then you're going to get, obviously the teams will have an outside sponsor, but also you will have outside sponsors that, you know, they're interested in your image, what you do. I mean, it's, it's what's happening now. Some of the athletes that get like, I don't know, there's a watch brand that they're interested or maybe there's an energy drink. Maybe there's a, I don't know, something uh, they they like the athlete to advertise, to use, to be an ambassador, you know, to be, you know, leading an opinion about this product. But the the, the payment, the, the money you get to do this, I think is still low because the sport is not big enough. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just watching tennis, like I'm getting a little bit more back into tennis. It's probably because the Netflix documentary, F1 in America, way bigger. They've just told the story and, and we lack that now in the mainstream. You know, the broadcast is one thing, but who tunes in? It's the core fan. So they, I understand what they're trying to do. But I think you've really got to push that broadcast and push the story into more mainstream things. But yeah, there's some riders that are learning to leverage that. Uh, outside industry, uh, a few sponsors on their helmets and stuff, which is, which is pretty key for sure. Oscar uh, Palmer, I mean, he's like to me, he's just a living legend of what he did in snowboarding and coming to the sport and all these stories. You know, like the bus. I mean, that's bigger than life. Just having this chrome, full-on rock star bus, and he was living the rock star life, but he backed it up. I mean, he was a incredibly gifted, but hardworking and strong-headed athlete like how impressive was he um to have around at the races or be, to be teammates with him uh i mean palmer i have a good i have a good memories from him i think uh when when we would be like 
anywhere at the apartment or a condo while racing um will be probably tra traveling at his home once or something like that uh along with him he we will always have like a casual chat very casual chat um, palmer was to me it wasn't like completely like another character was another person uh he was really interested in uh, in in motor gp so he knew I had friends racing the MotoGP back then, the circuit. So Gibernau, Cheka, and uh, he was really interested. He said, what are those guys doing? I'll, be, I'll love to do this. I would like to, to, you know, to jump on that circuit and being able to race these bikes. And then he had this CDR Honda uh, uh, Super Sport. I think it was. It wasn't a super bike. It was a little bit like a lighter or smaller than a super bike. And he was like so much into 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 uh, into GP racing. Um, we would talk about this, we would talk about a a anything when the races would come and then with the people around, he would transform himself a little bit into, into the character, into, into being Palmer, the Palmer, everyone knows yeah. actually in Palmer, everyone yeah. knows, but I, I met like another... a, like an alter ego. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and a little bit like the, you know, like the, uh, I say it's like a, it's like almost like not a catty catcher of, of himself, but it's like, it's like a. It's he he made yeah the the he was he was acting like in a movie if you want he would transform himself you know he would put up a show um, he probably had to put up a show because I told this a, a couple really like strong personalities in the circuit was Missy on one side and Palmer on the other side and and then he probably felt he had to you know to cope with that and and put up this show but the the Palmer I met was a lot a lot a lot different dude than. And the Palmer was out there. Uh, was someone uh, always really, you know, wanted to to actually to win? For him, doing like really good was not enough. He 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 was he was going like what we say like checkers or wreckers. So it's a little bit like that. His profile was like it's either I'm gonna win this or I'm not. But not was not getting top five. Not was like really going bad. Uh, I think he would, you know, he would he would risk a lot, but he really, like really his mindset. He would go racing, and then he, I think, he had the ability of like actually like unplugging. Obviously, he was financially like uh, doing great back then, getting like probably the best paid or one of the best paid, definitely the best paid athletes in in mountain biking. And and then when he would go racing, he would go absolutely going for it. Some of some of the time, I think. He had a lot more, a lot more brain, a lot more push, a lot more aim that 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 the talent some others would have. He would compensate. I'm not saying he didn't have talent. Of course, he had the talent, but yeah, he would, yeah, com yeah, he would compensate for some technique stuff because he was brave and he actually wanted to beat everyone. Yeah, like grit and determination. Because I remember getting to know him a little bit when he did that small little comeback, and. I said, well, how's it going? How's the training? And I, th I think he was like realistic about his age and the riding time. And he's like, yeah, but it doesn't matter because I wanted more than these little shits, you know? I was like, oh, how's the pedaling section going to go? He's like, I don't really care. I don't train as hard, but like I wanted more. So I'll just dig deeper, you know? And that was that. And, and that was, you know, after his heyday, after when he could, you know, when he came back those those years. And, and that struck me, you know, he... He really was a super self-confident, confident rider. Yeah. You, you would go on, on pedaling rides. We we had in in '99, my first year with the specials. We had a training camp in Mallorca, in Spain, in the island, and you would go for training rides. And he was, he, he was not as fit as you would think. He was like, a, a, you know, explosive. He got power, but to me, like. Seeing him, for example, in '97 succeeding, getting like fourth or third or fourth fifth in South Africa. Two years later, getting to meet him really, being the same team, being teammates, and I was like, man, how how is this guy? He would dig deeper. You know, he really. Crazy, eh? he, so you he, could see physically, he wasn't as fit as a lot of the guys, but somehow yes. he'd hang on a, on that pedley track. Yeah. Yeah, it's a unique individual, hey, that can push himself past what yeah. he physically should be able to do. Yeah, and and I said, like, for, to me, it was like it's it's uh, to me it was to me it was always like a, you know like a nice like like a nice guy. Obviously, Vasquez and myself were the Mexicans, 
you know, all the time. Yeah, Mexicans, yeah. what's happening? Yeah. This and that. But, but I mean, but I, he I, would call, uh, he'd just call you the Mexicans. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and many other people too. I mean, obviously now. Is that now, like your guy's nickname in America on the circuit and stuff? Uh, yeah, but I think some people will take it like knee names. Some people will use it like maybe like a, in, in a derogatory way. I personally never took it um, on the bad side. Probably nowadays people are a lot more sensible to that. But for me back then, <laughs> yeah. it was like, I mean, whatever, you know, it's like. Yeah, but you guys were kicking everyone's ass. There was that, that couple year run where you and Vasquez were doing so well. And what about the, you had some stories where you and Vasquez would, be doing training and you'd look at each other and he'd say, okay, I'll just do a chill run, like come behind me. And you know, for sure it was a race run and this is, it, there's no ways it was chill. Yeah. We would do that. I, I think I was like, I, uh, th these are the races, whether it was like national local races that we would do every now and then, uh, probably, uh, not so much, uh, not so much the World Cup, but still. And then, once you get to know the track a little bit, then it's like, okay, let's do a run. And then we'll do a run. We will follow each other. And then you will be hauling ass. Like you're absolutely risking everything. <laughs> and, you know, we'll come down to the bottom. It's like, fuck, man, that was quick. That was fast. It's like, yeah, that was okay. I was just chilling. And then we'll <laughs> yeah, be like, yeah. you know, super competitive all the time. And um, I think we were the first ones that we put like on a hillside. We will put like, um, we didn't have like the small plastic cones of, that many people are using now and anything. So we will mark it on like a small wooden sticks, like, you know, the old style. So we will go with this, with a hammer, pop, 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 and then we will put all these corners. And then those, that hillside was probably like only 25 to 30 seconds, not more than that, even, even 15 to 20 seconds. And then we had the stopwatch. We promised to be fair. So when he was on the on course, I would get his times with a stopwatch. And then I will tell him, you know, I will tell his time. Then he would actually come back up. So he will go up and then down, up and down. And then we will fight him for, you know, tenths of a second and crashing so many times. But that was like, that was like a real battle. We, we took it really serious. Like it was like only like me and him on the hill and then we'll come back forward. It's like, fuck man, I'm kicking your ass right now. It's like, let me look up one minute. Then you will pull your helmet on, goggles on. It's like ready. It's like, yeah, I'm ready, whatever. And then when you cross that line, it was full tilt all the time, back and forth, back and forth. Amazing sessions, um, uh, very competitive, uh, and and we share we share many years with David. We worked together at that JVC Spanish team. Um, then I hop into Candle. He would he would come the year after. They told me like, "What do you think about this kid?" He's like, "I know him. We've been teammates, and he was doing great. He was like a, a podium at, at Junior World Champs. So he was signed for Volvo Candle in '98. We went to specials for a couple of years." And then we went like I was B1, he was giant, and then we actually merged back in uh, Max's team. So for a year we were well, he was like more like the MSC team, so it's like the brand that the Spanish importer of Maxis uh, created, and I was like on the Maxis team. But we 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 would travel together. We had different bikes and different kit, but the team was like same team very much. So we would still be together. That's. That's epic. Uh, I was asked yesterday about training and technique, and this is one of the things I said. I said repetition. Repetition is so key. And and what you guys were doing in training, like mimicking race, under the clock, competitive, it must have helped so much uh, at the World Cups. Clearly, clearly it did. It, it did, and especially like, you know, like turning. I think we at one point we got really good at turning. Um because of these exercises, of course, uh, and, and, and repetition. And I think uh, what probably like I, I would work after is like trying to analyze and how could I do this better? How can I go faster? How can I tilt the bike more? How can I have more grip? And I would think more. So um, uh, nowadays when, I'm not saying like it's not a good thing to do, but there's too many laps in, in too many, uh, sorry, too many guys in downhill that they do laps. So they do a lot of volume, but at one point, downhill is only four minutes. And these four minutes, you need to be as accurate as possible. And you want to be as fast as you can. So more laps in terms of like long laps, I'm understanding three, four minute runs. I think 
you have to pay attention to the little things where it's like, I'm going to get this better and this and this and this and this. And that's what I call the technique side. Obviously, you work hard in the gym. You do your intervals, your sprints and all that. And then if you're really good at these two things, there's you, we can dissect those things. But if you're really good at these two things, then there is a whole new world that as I, I, I normally tell the riders starts on Thursdays and finishes on Sundays. And that is racing. And that is completely different. You can be like so capable, so good, so gifted. And then it's the racing game, the competition. Some people cannot face competition. You can see like it's like it's, they are anti-competition. Some people they can and they have difficulties. So you need to get better at this game of racing. And some people, they are also gifted to do this. They understand that, you know, they are the ones that they actually like, um, they really get excited. They really like the feeling of that uncertainty that you have when you're racing. And you think it's a natural thing? Like I always think, like chemically, I think Greg's brain is chemically balanced different to mine. Certain, I mean, you could speak to that. It's certain amount of pressure was good, say for someone like me, and then there was a management game. And Greg seemed like the pressure needed to be higher and really crazy high. And then there was a little bit of management he needed to do. Um, like, yeah, how do you how do you look at that now? I mean, we're skipping a little bit ahead, but you as the technical coach, which is also basically psychologist as well at these races. I, I would use some of the psychology, because I worked with the sports psychologist many years. So working with him, obviously you get the knowledge and you understand how things work. But also like when I pass on the coach, I never like to step on anyone's toes. So I said like, I think I can do the technique side. I understand how to dissect the course, how to help the rider, how to set up the bike, how to help in many areas. And obviously, especially in downhill, the racing side, the mental side, the psychological side is very, very, it, it has to be together. I mean, it, it goes together with the technique almost. Not to say that you have to be fit enough. But to me, fit enough is more like the mechanical side. It would be like the easiest side, especially in downhill. Because in downhill is one of the sports, physically, you don't need to have a certain profile. You can have a guy that's a BMXer that can push out of the gate, I don't know, 18, 2000 watts, can be a downhill world champion. You can have someone that is sort of like skinny, maybe like more built like an endurance athlete. And then he or she can also be world champion. So the profile is not like when you go to athletics, oh, that's a profile, he's a sprinter, and you are a sprinter. You never race marathons. So in downhill, you know, that doesn't correlate. So with X profile, you you, you train enough, specifically enough, and, and then obviously you have to be like uh, uh, training correctly to bring the athlete to, to top uh, fitness to race downhill. You train the technique and then uh, obviously you do that, that mind skill. And when I started coaching, I always went to the same sports psychologist I used to work. And after so many years, you know, we ended up having a friendship and I would have the profile. So the scanner of the athlete is like, look, this is what I've got. This athlete, boom, goes here, does this, boom, bam, bam, bam. I think I should be working towards this direction, doing this and working on that. And, and, and that's what's happening. And they're probably correcting, probably helping him in this area, in that other area. And then just looking for his confirmation when the box were checked and I would go and help, the, obviously help the athlete. There is many steps and many ways I can do it without having to go to him, but I always like to verify He's a professional. He's been doing sports psychology for 35 years, not only in two wheels, but in many, many other sports. So, I mean, he's a great guy to work with, and I think it's it's essential. And to the Greg's uh, points you, you brought up, yes, it's absolutely genetical. Some people can really cope with that. Uh, if you look at a lot of the people that can cope really well with competition, sometimes in a lot of other areas in life, they are not so good at managing. Maybe not only mountain bike. I don't know someone in mountain bike, but if you look at a lot of the sports celebrities that they're doing great at competing, they are not great at managing life afterwards. Because if you think about this, racing is the shittiest investment in life. You train hard, 
you pedal your bike like a madman, use skills, put all support, you put all this energy, you make all these investments, right? If you make an investment, if you put like $100,000, you want a 5% at least, right? Four to six, uh, four to well, six. Yeah, worst case, but yeah. yes, at Four least to, inflation you, plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're looking for a five to ten percent, something like this, whatever. Yeah. It, I mean, it depends on what kind of business you want to be. But let's say like you're looking for someone that's like, okay, what are the odds that this goes right? Okay, X amount of percentage, cool, that's going to be okay. You put in this money knowing that most likely you will have something in return. When you're racing in general in competition, you put all this let's call it money, you put all this effort, you put all this energy, not to say the people that in motorsports, they have to be paying for. You put all this, and when you are on the line, you're risking everything. You have, no to, be, you have to be aiming to risk absolutely everything. The problem is there are some people that can really cope with this uncertainty. And then you would be in point A, which is the start, Point B is the finish as a downhiller. And then I don't care if you are uh, probably going for the win or going for the overall or going to save your contract for next year or going to whatever. There is a lot of people that from A to B, it's like they would sign to go to B with X result. The action is what you actually like, is your threat what you are actually, because it's that is where you can fail. That is where you can fail. So the people that are gifted, they can really focus in the action, thinking like, I have this. And they really have this trust that knowing if they, I do what I need to do, the way I need to do, how I need to do, what I need to do, with intensity and with the duration, I got this. My probabilities are high that I achieve the goals, that I achieve what I want. And this is where most of the people is like really struggle really struggle and it's already like a few days before so some people you know and this could happen to the guy that it's actually like fighting for first or is the guy that's fighting for qualifying it's the same thing if you go up for qualifying you see all these kids that they are a number you know three digit numbers on the plates the stress is huge they're not going for the win they want to qualify but of course that's that's their goal and they need to make it mm. through the run best way possible to actually like secure uh, or, or or get qualified. So this is where I think uh, for a lot of athletes is where they need to put more emphasis because it's, if you manage that, maybe if that's something that I can ever understood from the Americans. Obviously, I'm Spanish, and and there is you know there is a, the language and the culture barrier. But they say like, yeah, Oscar, come on, let's rip it up, go have fun. I was like, what the fuck? Have fun. Excuse me, the language, but it's like, it, maybe no, not. You, you can speak freely. Maybe, maybe not. Have fun or maybe not. Maybe I'm not really enjoying this. I would enjoy going with Andrew, doing some laps on the bike park. This is fun. Yeah. You know, we're going in the bike park. But it's we... a, yeah, but it's a way to decrease the pressure. It's a, I, I still do it. I, I have like friends that are still playing pro sports and, and I text them like it, enjoy Like, it's a, it's actually a shitty thing to say because some of it's not enjoyable. Racing, exactly. It's not. It's not. What you get out of it is enjoyable. The lifestyle you get is enjoyable. Like getting to ride your bike is enjoyable. You've got to reframe it and make a lot of it enjoyable because that's what you sign up for. But I was going to say, I mean, are you like? Would you say so many athletes are leaving a lot out on the table? And I'm not picking apart at anyone. I'm just saying like the physical is looked at, the testing's looked at, all the stuff. But there are so many gains you can get from having a stronger mental side. And, and whether that's seeing a psychologist or doing more practice under the clock or doing whatever that helps you to manage a race weekend. Absolutely. I always, I mean, yeah. you, I mean, you know from, from what we were at, a, a giant together. I like the simulation game. Because, for example, in downhill, there's something that happens that I never understood. It's like I understand. I mean, there's sessions and sessions. There's many hours. We can we can put the time in working in so many different ways. But at one point, what we're doing is like you're doing a warm up run in the morning, for example. Semifinals and finals over the years has been in the same day, one after the other, or the day after, whatever. But you do a run 
or maybe a two back to back. And then you have a pause of like two to three hours, an hour. That means like your body's cooling down. You have to unplug if you, if you can, of course. Um, and then you need to get back to action without a, a pre warm up. It's not that day. It's like, okay, Andrew, now we'll let you do a run. And then you take the leaf back up and then you're ready for a race run. That does not exist yet to the date. Yeah. So that means like simulation is one thing I always like to do with athletes, where it's like, we're going to do this. And then you remember, for example, like Danny would get pissed at these simulations. Maybe we started before you came into the team, but Danny would get really angry at the simulations because it looked like a waste of time. But it's like, okay, Danny, yeah. you're, war you're warming up and then you're doing a proper warm-up. Because he just warm wanted to ride his bike. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Totally, I remember that. And then you do a proper warm-up. And then when you do a proper warm-up, it's like, okay, now you're doing for two warm-up runs. And then I would stop you for two hours. What to do? I don't know. You show me what to do. We'll work on something that when we are at the races, it makes sense. And then you can do this thing for two hours. And then we're going to get back to warming up to do a race run. And that's going to be a race run. So you go to a place, you exactly know the track. Your best time is two minutes, 35 seconds. And then it's like, I want you to do 35 or better. So that's, that's the goal, to do your personal best on that track that you know so well. And if you don't achieve or you make a mistake and you do a 236, it's game over. You know, bike gets in the van, pop-up tents, they get folded. We, get, we head back to the accommodation. And, 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 the, and this is one of the things like training really is specific or simulating a lot of the uh, scenarios you might find in, in downhill racing, but definitely to work on that a sports psychologist if you need it it's now a little bit more common to talk about yeah obviously like they, they call it mental health but yeah to be like i need to get better in this area if i work in the gym why should i not be working in the way i manage this all these emotions to be managed in a way that maybe i would never be like absolute best absolute sh an absolute killer but if it's good enough with all the talent you have and with all this this work you put in and all the energy and all the great product and stuff, maybe, I mean, it to me, it's always been a matter of like trying to extract the, the you know, the sense out of you, trying to really extract your best and then trying to achieve the most. And then probably everyone has got a, some sort of a ceiling, but trying to like get the ceiling. So the day... The day, two things for me was a really important. It's like the day I retired, it's like I could say I put everything in this. This was it. I made many mistakes, more than anyone else probably, but I put everything in this. I learned a lot from it as a result, but I put everything in it. And the other thing I never understood is like you retire when you are at your highest. I always said like, look, I'm going to retire when I have enough of this. Period. If I don't have enough of this, I'm not retired. I'm not quitting. So, it, I mean, it, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. I, you're not at your highest. You're not getting results. Yes, but it's like, why are you doing this? I'm doing this because I like doing this. If I like doing this, I will keep on doing this. That's it. If I need to pay it out, of my, out of my money, I pay. If I'm not making money out of this, I don't make money. But I want to do it until the day I have enough. Pretty much until the day I got fed up with this. And then it's over. And, and then, then I'll I'll turn the page and go to the next thing. And what was that? What was that like? Um, retirement for you? I don't know if we've spoken about it directly. Directly. Um, what was the transition like? You've just said the conversation was like you were fed up. I think I was as well. I could have probably, and I wanted to get on a team that was fun, come home more. That didn't really work. And then my dad said, well, why don't you just invest in yourself and go race? I said, well, I don't, that's a shit investment. What's the point? I'm going to spend how many 50,000 euros or whatever for the year, uh, maybe not get a factory team. And I think, but I think more importantly, I was just burnt out. If I really wanted, I would have invested in it, like you said. So what was it like for you? Um, I mean, to me it was, I mean, I was like, I, I, age didn't really matter because I was feeling, I was feeling good. I was feeling fit. I, I, you know, that was not, not really like a, what made me change, but it was like, after the years, it's like, okay, now I'm putting a lot into this. I'm still enjoying, I'm still, um, I wouldn't say maybe not growing, but learning in many areas of the sport. 
And a sport has been, has been a teacher for me. It taught me so many things. I had to come from a country that had no tradition in mountain bike. Uh, you know how hard it is like for someone that is, first of all, not English spoken, coming from Spain, breaking it, making it to the States, going through all these teams. Um, you know, you had some already some, let's say some, some, some background or all, all these results, your sport career was getting to obviously towards the end because you know, you have a biologically, there is a limit in age. And then at one point I said, like, look, like all the energy I need to actually do this, I had already so many things, so many projects in my head that I said, like, I, I, I need to get onto these projects. This is, this match is, is already burned. This is the end of it. I can see the end of it. I can stretch maybe one or two years. I can still get paid doing this. But it's like, there's other projects waiting, other projects that they are exciting let's jump onto these onto these projects because i felt like with the amount of energy even if I, I i i put a lot of energy the best years instead of like not only results but in terms of like performance they were gone they were gone and then to me what would have kept me racing would be the testing which i think i've always kind of good at testing but i didn't have the opportunity i didn't have an offer to actually be like testing for someone uh i tried to actually I spoke to some of the brands because if you look at other sports, especially like motorsports, there'll be like yeah. an ex, ex pilot testing or, or pre testing, if you want, and then doing the hard work. So when you get to the main, to the to the factory guys, that product is already like on the way. It's already in a good direction, a very good point. And then they fine tune it, they decide if they want this or that. So there's small changes, but the base work is already done. That didn't happen, and I was like, "It's time to it's it's time to do you know some, something else." And and I had already like the the uh, bike park in Andorra that I was directing, and they were my sponsor in the last few years I raced. So that was also like after two thousand three for me it was like instead of being in a team, I wanna I wanna build my own team. I wanna decide myself. I wanna talk to the sponsors. I wanna talk to people. I wanna know the industry a little bit better. I wanna know what's actually managing a budget deciding, organizing the trips, doing the way I want. So it was me and my mechanic that would go and do the walk-up circuit. And that also helped, but that was like a second stage of racing, 2004 until 2008. And then in 2008, I said, like, okay, that's over. I have the bike park. I will take care of these. And I have, still have time. Let's see what time, you know, brings. And I had some, so a few projects, but I just, I just pretty much choose the first one that, that came on board after that. Did you miss it? I know it's been a while now. Like, did you miss uh, single-mindedly focusing on racing and all that, you know, when you retired the first year or two? Like, what was the emotional state like? Mm, no. Transition was absolutely smooth. I, I, I didn't miss it. I, I miss, I mean, I still miss now racing. So I, I would go to the bike park now and I would do like a couple, a couple of runs couple of really fast runs so i will do like all style with my stopwatch and try to you know that hit a good time what now so. still yeah still I would do you think you still. can still beat you think that um because you laid down faster times than marcelo danny and i at your bike park and you were older than us and not riding every day but with your technique and the shortness of the track you could smoke us you think you could still smoke us or the the current crop on like a short the track like, turns. The thing, I mean, it depends on the track, but it's like, I mean, you're losing. Eh? With age, you're losing quick. I'm trying to keep yeah. that line. I'm trying to keep the line of decline. How know, do you, as, as I don't want to do it. I don't want to hit the ground. Yeah, I'm like, I, I did that the other day. I went, I think I was mentally a bit burnt out. And I was like, yeah, I guess I haven't ridden for a few days. So I went on my own. And yeah, I think I like mentally dropped in and just sparked a race run in at my level right now. Yeah, a little bit above my comfort zone or chilled. And I was like, huh, that felt pretty good. Yeah. And I was like, but that's kind of dangerous because I'm now it's, on my own. It is. It is and yeah. I'm going to hit the ground and I don't need to hit the ground. Um, so it's a fine line, hey, because you, you, that's like what made us kind of alive, you know, it's like kind of the flow state, right? Or like looking for the flow state. You know, you can't think of anything. You're just reacting. 
you know, and yes. when you get the breaking point perfect, you know if you've got to turn good after you've raced for long enough. Like, you yeah. know if you did it good. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and then that was like a, I mean, you describe it now. It's very, it's, it's very easy. To me, like, when you actually like racing, you get the flow state, which is called like, you know, the float state. Uh, and you have, you know, you get into this mind flow where you only like seeing a few things you're not really proceeding exactly everything but you're so focused on the task that everything kind of like flows and then you make it to the bottom it's like fuck you, you know at least in terms of like flow not flow and writing but in terms of like a, how everything happened it's like oof, that that I'm, probably that's a good run because when you had that feeling it's like because you were like really on the task and nothing else when you yeah. start having your screen split so half of your action or 80% or, or 70%, it depends. But there's always like some part of the screen that is your computer. It's what you just mentioned. It's like your brain telling you like, that corner was good. Yeah, that's not so good. I'm up or I'm down? On all these questions you might have on a, on, on a race run, more percentage or, or more, let's say like more, dis, more uh, disturbance, more uh, interruptions or less, uh, that's... That's a little bit what I think can change a lot of your performance. If you can really eliminate that computer, it's like you don't even realize if you hit it right or not. It's like you are ready to the next 100%, corner. 100%, yeah. Bump, bump, yeah. Bump, bump, like this. Um, so I still think now that what I'm missing is to have, and I really get excited, for example, like I haven't been racing down for a while. I think 20... 2017, 2018 was the last race. And I was still like, uh, some of the local guys, Alex Marine was here and then some other people. And I was like closing times. So I was like within within less than a second or to then. I would like to get a downhill bike uh, next year and actually race w one or two local events to see, to see what happens. But just to feel like, I like the fact that to prepare and to have the, um, how you say, uh, to yeah to to have that feeling like it's like okay now it's time to perform you know i have my stargate is this time and i want like actually to perform because i always been like kind of like and sometimes that's 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 hasn't led to anything good but i would come home for example like new trials bike i would buy like a new motorcycle trials bike i would go on the rocks here on the creek just next to my house and then i mean brand new the thing and I would put my boots on my helmet. I will be on jeans or something, and I will get all excited. It's like, well, like, let me see this rock. Wow, it works perfect. Look at the look at the clutch. Look at the suspension and everything. And then I would go to, you know, higher level, more you know, more difficult sections where my old bike I would do, but not with a brand new bike. You know, pretty much like out of the box. And then I would take it to the point where I would crash badly because I would take it too far already. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. so hitting the ground is, it's, is a little bit like this. I would get to the point where it's like, maybe now sometimes, yes, I start thinking, okay, it's cool, but <laughs> you know, give it, give it like maybe like a couple of fast runs and that's it. Then it's like, I need to level down a little bit. Not that I'm getting overexcited, but I know that when you're riding at your limit, whatever the limit is, you know, chances of crashing, we need to understand, we need to accept that. They are there, of course, and it's 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 kind of dangerous. And you can get, you know, people are getting injured sometimes really bad. So fingers crossed, and 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 we never had really bad injuries during the career, but it still can happen. Yeah, no, exactly. No touch wood. It's it's a touch a catch twenty two. I I um haven't really gone on a down. Well, I haven't even thought about doing a downhill race because I don't like that preparation, the anxiety, and the start time and sitting around. I'm like. I don't have to do that. They don't pay me to do that anymore. Why would I go and put myself through? It's so uncomfortable. But it's a good exercise. Um, but that's where the, but that's where the mentality. And I helped design this new track, and I was like, yeah, if I was available, part of me is like, maybe I should just see what it feels like and where the time is. But part of me thinks that if I'm far back, I'm gonna try hard and probably do something silly as well because I'm not prepared. But yeah, no, it's a, uh, it's such a catch twenty two. So you didn't quite miss it because you'd made the decision. You're probably burnt out. Sounds similar, like you know the traveling, the sacrifices after all those years. You know, and you you know, there's obviously more to life. Um, you, you're a father. You would know that probably more than me. Um, and then getting into the coaching, the technical side, your career now. I mean, that's a huge part of it. 
Um, the, the the coaching, I mean, uh, last years of racing, I helped a couple of juniors and then um, I would do this, uh, this summer clinic once or twice every season in the bike park with people who would like to uh, like, uh, improve downhill skills. Some of them were racing national level, masters even, and I would do that. Um, but most with the juniors, I start coaching and I was like, man, I, 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 I like this thing. I think I understand enough mm-hmm. from the sport. I think I can, I can help uh, people enough, but also start getting to another analytical level higher than I was as a racer, uh, being able to look things with more perspective, understanding a little bit more uh, the sport or the, 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 the competition itself in, in general. Uh, and then, you know, I got the Spanish Federation got into the elections and then the new president called me knowing that I quit from racing professional and they said, Lacoste, we want you as a mountain bike coach. So I was a mountain b- national coach for, for a year. It was not even like a 12 uh, period uh, time because uh, I, I kind of like started at the end of uh, 2008 and uh, I think that took me after Canberra Wells. Before Canberra Wells, I knew the Federation was gone. To me, it was like something I had on the bucket list is like, I've been 16 years on the national team. I w- I've lived from the outside the Federation. I want to see what's like from the inside. I did it one year. I didn't like it. And I said like, okay, hey, cool. It's, it's, it's done. It's, it's time to, to, uh, to step to the next thing. And that same World Championships is when I got an offer from Giant. It's like, Oscar, we would like you to actually come coach the guys of a downhill. We are renewing the downhill team. And that is what I had a little bit of a say of picking up Danny. Duncan Riffle was already signed and was on a, on a, on a contract cycle with Giant. And then I, you know, I, I, I kind of like insisted to have Danny on board because I always thought this kid has got so much talent. This kid can be good at racing. Yeah. Uh, and, and I met him when he was 15, racing those Maxis European caps and all that. He would come with his father, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so I insisted. And that is where I actually like had the time because the bike park was a summer thing. Obviously, the preparation into it during the winter. I had the rental booth. I have my crew working there, designing, doing these, you know, all the financial stuff with the bike park, with the company, with the ski resort. But once that was like, you know, launched, then... Obviously, my eyes were there. So if I wasn't traveling, I was, you know, living in Andorra pretty much all the time. But when I was when I was traveling, I could really focus on 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 the team. And that when 2010 was downhill, 2011 was XC because Giant, uh, the manager from the XC team, came and said, like Oscar, I tried many people at technical. I never was happy with them, but I want to try you. So I was like 2011, and then 2012 is where Rabobank. Uh, road team said like oh, we're gonna pick this guy because it looks like he can do any discipline so let's 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 pick this guy so for me it was like 2010 2011 2012 consecutively years where like i would get into another discipline one more discipline to actually work with so it was like really like uh, very new uh very new every year very exciting lots of work and 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 lots of traveling but it was it was so it, it was such a such a such a everything was uh, so excited uh, everything was um, I was I was growing I was learning from all sides of things so that's how I that's how I got into the coaching and downhill was mainly the the main part for 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 many 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 years until obviously Giant decided to get more into the cross country into the cross country world and then it was like obviously. Cross country would take some time out of the out of downhill. Schedules were still compatible, so I could do both. Nowadays, it's not compatible anymore. You know, I mean, the sports obviously there is such a two different disciplines, far apart. I still think crossing over, and then athletes should learn. I understand athletes having respect for the other discipline, even if they don't know much, because they don't even follow the results or who wins or who is good or. Who, who are the you know the freshmen coming to the rookies or stuff, but uh, a, a crossing over, l- learn from the others. I think there's still even being so different nowadays, in in any aspect, cross country and downhill. There is so much things that the athlete can learn one from the others, and uh, so I've been I've been in the mix. I've been in between, bouncing from one side to the other. 
What uh, what do you think downhillers can learn from XE and and vice versa? Um, I think a lot of the downhill, obviously, it's a, it's a it's a different profile already from of personality. But for sure, the working ethic of cross country. Yeah, uh, professionalism is like a new I, next level. Exactly, the professionalism. For example, like you see. I mean, it's not as bad as back in the day, but you see like people finishing runs in downhill and they're chilling the finish line, even if it's cold for a while. You don't see. I don't running. understand that. I'm like yeah. shouting at the screen, like, hey, yeah. especially with the semi to the final. I'm like, what are you doing? Your manager yeah. can tell you the times of the rest of the guys. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. So it's like, so small things like this, for example, like if you need to make some sacrifices in diet, for example, if you need to get to the place and it's like, okay, I don't have a spinning bike. But I can go for a job. Let's go for a job. Let's do this. Let's do gym sessions. Like so, just importing some of it. I'm not saying they do the same thing because they are completely different disciplines. Cross country, the main thing they need to understand and learn from the talent and the riding. So basically, the technique. Because at the end, it also counts, and it counts every day more in cross country. So you need to realize, like, look at these downhill guys. They're not crazy. I always said, like, the downhill guys are not crazy. Or downhill athlete, whether it's 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 a it's a female or a male, they are not crazy. No one that is crazy gets top ten at the World Cup. Before getting to the level of top ten, they kill themselves. It's a an, an, it's, it's an elimination because you don't make it to the level if you're crazy because you're gonna hit the ground hard and you're gonna get hurt. So you, you, you might make it like, you know, like a spike all of a sudden, like, pop, you get up there. But if you're risking too much because it's all based in, in bravery and because you really like, you, you don't really care of the consequences at all, that's not going to last long. So whoever has got a success, successful career and they can sustain that, that's because they are not crazy. Obviously, you need to aim for risking. You kind of like the risk uh, aspect of, of the sport, but you're super talented. You know how far you can take it, and you take it to the edge. When you take it to the edge, sometimes the coin flips, and then obviously, and obviously you crash. But you take it to the edge. So that talent, that that sharpness that the downhill athletes have, that's something the cross country can can really import. Can absolutely really. Yeah, I agree. Everyone, everyone asks me, "How do you do it? What do you think about?" I'm like, I I think we're just so prepared. There's a level, yeah. There's a level of risk, but. By the time you do a downhill race run, you should know every single route and pebble and the speed you've decided to go. You do up at a level, and like you say, the crashes that happen in race runs, they're not that often. You know, now with the competition a little bit more, I don't know if you compare the 2000s, 2010 versus 2020, more crashes in race runs now. I think the level, like people are willing to risk more, but they're not crazy. I mean, obviously, the sport has evolved to where the times are are, are tighter. Yes, the times are really yeah. tighter. Um, on some of the tracks, we can see that, you know, you see more gaps. Like, it, it, it also happened in the past. In the past, was all actually, like, sometimes more gaps than rather super close. But it was more natural terrain. Let's suppose nowadays, I think there is, like, everyone is, I would not say, in, like, in, in all in the same line. But the lines are not as different as before. And also they have more stuff to push. So they are more on rails and that makes tighter times. And obviously the sport has evolved. So where the guys are like similar to the point where like when you get to the races, like the bikes are set up, all the bikes are really similar. So it's, it has like brought them to like a narrow bend. Um, but I think mainly it's because like really like the tracks is like they had the, the track so dialed. There's no variables instead of like the, the track, uh, you know, changing. Some of the races you can see like they have more gaps. Some others are like they are, they are tighter. In terms of like, competition, when you look at the list of the nineties, I mean, you look at the names. Some of the people don't remember, but I mean, it was your teammate. It started for US. You have Carter King, uh, Miles Rockwell. You have Palmer Tomac. You got a bunch of guys that were fast. The Frenchies were also fast. Australians would come mid late nineties, but they were also fast. So names, I think names and competition has always been. I mean, if you want to make it to the top of the sport. It's always huge level everywhere, huge level everywhere. I think nowadays, because of the tight times, they need to risk probably even more than we would risk. So they need to like, you really need to, you know, nail your run if you want to meet to the top, top, top. If you make a slight mistake, that one or two seconds, that sets you back too far. 
Well, in the past, yeah. probably the consequences were not as bad. Yeah, maybe the ri- there's the risk, but there's also the level that you have to be so clinically clean and, and get your 100% run. Yes. When the day you could make an error or two and then maybe, you know, and come yes, back. time is lost, push yeah. a bit, and you could yeah. come back and be like, okay, I'm yeah. I'm eighth, but that was a podium yeah. time yeah. if I didn't mess up. Now it's like, you know, I see it when people are coming back from injury and even Loic, he had to come back and, he, he you know, you get 25th. But I was like... You can't be that despondent because if you look at the time gap, two, three seconds off where you want to be or two seconds off, I mean, that really is not a lot. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it, I think it's what also like, I mean, they wanted the sport to be like this also. You know, to be exciting, to be watching on TV, the time is being tight, the people risking, the people risking and then sometimes having the consequence of a crashing. But it's like real, like you see people like riding at the very edge. If there is a mistake of two or three seconds, you're not coming back. It's like it's lost. No, not back a in the day. Sometimes you, like- you, you make a, se- a mistake. Maybe you can come back still a little bit. Nowadays, uh, yeah, you're not coming back from a mistake like this. You're not making the time that easy. Do you like where the sport is and and potentially is going? I I, I like it, but I see it sometimes. It's uh, I say like it's I see it like it's a slippery slope. When you look at the obviously every day less and less I think I mean I might maybe stacking but when you talk to the brands of the people that are in sales there's no sales on downhill bikes you know the niche is like so 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 small some parts of the world they have some some sales but the market is so small and I think the sport has to be sold really good on on TV having I mean it's been the uh, I say the life, life footage is so much better than it used to be a few years ago so with live, live footage, they can sell the sport. We can have a lot more spectators understanding what the sport is like. And to me, it's making, I mean, I don't know how to put it in, in words, but to make the sport really like more serious, like more a sport, and to make it to the sport to the next level, because obviously that's a sport where it's not, it's not an Olympic sport. So you don't have funding from the governments. And so the sales are not really helping the sport. So what else do you have? It's a great sport amazing sport with great athletes too i would like the athletes to look like athletes and to behave like athletes and i would like the sport to actually raise the bar to the next maybe like if you put it marketing or commercial level where it's like well now it's like this is on tv sponsor from outside are coming athletes might might be making more money but that will be as a consequence i think of making the sport more noticeable so it's more like it, it reaches more people on tv and even people, they are not super passionate about mountain bike or about uh, downhill mountain bike that they meet, maybe don't even know really the sport. They get to watch it on TV and they get us like, holy shit, this is great. This is good. Someone that is not really a big fan. Maybe there's some people watching, I don't know, some sports on TV. They are not super huge fan. I look at athletics. I never, I never was doing athletics. But when you look at people doing track and field, Okay, this is interesting. I'm interested in any sport. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm kind of like a, a weird in this in in this in this fashion because I like all sort of sport. I get passionate about all cycling disciplines, etc. But you look at sport, maybe you're not a big fan. You're not into that sport, but then you start getting interested just by watching it. It's attractive. Probably will be the word attractive. So I think it's like if they make it attractive to more people, and I hope they can make it attractive to more people see if there is a person or a group of persons that actually puts together, regroups all the managers and all the writers. They need to have an agreement, I think. Oh, to see like going in one direction because I think downhill has been over the years, too many people going this way, this way, this way. Everyone is doing their own thing. And I think they need Mm. to like, okay, we're going this direction. We think that's the direction we need to go and really like, you know, really going all in one one direction but who who gets to decide that who should help with that decision of direction uh, formula one you know you had eccleston at one point that was deciding i guess everyone trusts the guy he's he he was the guy that puts the tv on these and if you look at moto gp carmelo Spaletta from spain was the guy that said like well this is moto gp if you look at moto gp back in the 80s or something you will look at the pits um, you look at how the mechanics, uh, 
you know, mechanics were like nobody was dressed corporate. They didn't, didn't care about the sponsor. You know, everything was kind of like disorganized. It wasn't TV every now and then. If you look at now, they have like the, obviously the, the forecasting really properly. They have the team that goes to the pits. They have the way they actually produce, they, they package the sport to actually show to the people. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It makes it attractive. It's got a, it's got a very nice, uh, you know, the, it looks like a showroom. It's very nice. Everything you look, mm. it's, it's kind of cool. They make it, you know, excite, exciting. So I think like Daniel should get that, that role, that person of maybe a core of like two or three persons that actually like, because I think, honestly, I think it's, 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 it's probably the only way. If you look at, if you have to rely on factory teams, do you know what the factory teams would be? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know how a factory team, how much they can pay. If all of a sudden, like, you have four stepping, uh, you've got, I don't know, you know, you got Pepsi, or you have, like, Apple sponsoring a team, or Samsung, and the other one is sponsored by some other, you know, big sponsor, then when you got the sponsors, it's because they have the impacts they need. So they have the publicity, the advertising they are interested in, they have it. And then those, I think that's going to make it to, like, you jump into the next level financially. Otherwise, I mean, I think a factory team, a, a bike brand is going to pay you also for the impacts, but it has a limitation. When you bring others, I mean, if you look at Supercross or the MotoGP, at the end, who's paying for it? You know, all those sponsors are paying for it. All the big sponsors are paying for it. Yeah, it's in an interesting inflection point now i guess with the attempt of the broadcast to grow and clearly they would i would guess you know being backed by discovery and warner bros they obviously want to monetize that um so we interesting to see what happens this year but like you say i guess it would be healthy if we could get more people on the same page and more people with a say um i say more people obviously more cooks in the broth doesn't help but certain riders maybe they're former riders and team managers and and the industry get together you know because like you say now the bike industry is just paying for everything and not yes. getting enough out it seems it's and it's it's like this so i think that's like you know that's how you actually hit hit the limit and they have to the un unlock this 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 next step and uh and hopefully like i mean I haven't been in downhill this year. I won't be in downhill coaching downhill next year, but I'm really passionate about the sport. Obviously, it's been what I've been doing like for, I mean, 16 years. It's crazy that I've been like, I think it's 32nd season of the World Cup this, this year. 32nd yeah. th this year that you'll be at, at the races. Yeah, 32nd. 16, 16, 16. So 16 years racing, 16 years coach. Jeez, and, uh, and, obviously, and, and like you said, you thought you'd be finished at 30. You yes. Know? Yeah, so third is like, how oh, you're doing something else. You're going somewhere else. You'll do something else. I finished my law degree and I'll, you know, I'll be like some some lawyer. I'll do some something to do with with contracts. Or I was passionate about about taxes and um, and uh, yeah, finance, finance taxing probably was like w w one of my things. But uh, well, I never I never finished it. I never finished my my law degree. I came back. I came back to university after after racing and I. You know, I asked for it. It's like, oh, Oscar, maybe it's like it's another two or three years for you. And I was like, oh, well, I got some stuff to do. Yeah, again, I had the other train that was passing. It's like, I better hop on this train. I always have this university thing, you know, that I can I can always I can always uh, tackle that later on or, you know, whenever I, I feel like I I, uh, I have to do it. So, so far, no no time. So, so it hasn't been possible. So are your taxes pretty in order? Are you pretty good. Yeah. Are you pretty? Are you pretty switched on and on time with your taxes? Yes, I am. I am. I am. You have to, <laughs> otherwise they come chasing after you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does pay to be at least on time or pay someone good to do it for you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what absolutely. um? Yeah, I I am um, like the money thing. I don't always come back to it, but it's an a a, a a nuisance in the world. You like money money makes the world go round and, and often if you f follow the money you figure things out but I like I come from an athlete side wanting it to be just as fair as possible right and part of me wonders if a lot of the riders know how short their career could be and and how they spend their money like do you sometimes look from a distance as an 
as an experienced person <laughs> and go, shit, I don't think they know uh, what what they're doing, you know, and, and maybe did you buy yourself time after your racing, like financially? Because that also like makes retirement easier. Mm. Not really. I never, I never wanted to. Obviously, you know, at the end of the career, you've you've gone okay. I was never a person that would spend money in toys and stuff like that. So I, I, I put some money in the side, some decent money in the side, and then uh, I said, well, what am I going to do now? But I never had time to actually. What am I going to do now? I had something always falling in my lap, left or right. Is like, well, this is exciting. <laughs> this is actually kind of cool. So it's like, you know, let's go to the next thing. I, I don't know. I'm not hyperactive, but I don't know how to stay put. And there's always yeah, like that's a you're a high achiever, man. It's like per, a type personality. Yeah, call it. I don't know. Yeah, you, there's books they they talk about this. I I read a few, I, I read a few books in the past. They talk about mm -hmm. a personality and all that, but a type. But but it's like you 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 just gotta you know you just gotta you have the pulsion. You have like the the feeling. And I would be equally good because I told like a lot of my friends like Oscar, if you don't do this, like look, I paid to be a coach because I think I'm I'm good at doing this. But I would be happy, and I enjoy, of course, doing this. And I have my challenges, and I I like pushing. I don't care if it's Sunday. If I have to do something, I would go for it and I do it. Uh, but if I would be like a carpenter, I will enjoy doing it. You know, if I would do like something working with the CNC machine doing metal parts, I will enjoy doing this. It's like I always want to, you know, something that brings me like the 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 learning experience. Honestly, it's like it's 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 about learning and ma and making it you know as good as you can. So when you make, I don't know, something made out of wood, or if you are a construction guy, it's like I'm gonna build the best houses, and they probably will end up being like a good house of. But if it's one of the best houses, I'll be happy with. And being and being those you know building those houses like I mean look at what I've done I, I I do a good job at doing this so that's I think that's what's kept me like jumping from from one one thing to the other and sometimes I think thinking back is like what if I wouldn't take this juncture left and I would have go right or straight because I had two or three projects at the same time it's like what would happen if I would have go this way you know how this wouldn't end up or where I would be now and you know. But I, I think I, I, I have this thing. It, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't go away with time. The same as with the lack of speed, it doesn't go away with time. You always have it. And some people like it's like ask, why do we need? Why do you want to go so fast? It's like I don't know. I just want to see. I don't high con see. on high, yeah, on high consequences sometimes. But I just want to see. <laughs> let's see. Let's let's try this. <laughs> so I think like the, the try thing is what's actually like maybe like always like a, start a new thing and then. And then see what's 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 going on. It was a little bit like this, like in, in road cycling. But I f first got a call. I'm like, holy shit! You know, road cycling. I knew some of the guys yeah. the, on the peloton back in what the did 90s. You, what did you think? Were you like, what? Are, I mean, what am I going to teach these guys? I mean, obviously, uh, you knew you could help them with some descents and stuff. Like what? Well, before okay, pause the road. Um, you said an interesting thing, like the way you do think. You just want to be good at something or put your best foot forward. But I think that's brilliant advice, especially if you're in a, a time in your life where you don't know what to do and you get a opportunity. Maybe it's not an opportunity forever, but just do it as good as a job and be proud of that. And if it fails or you decide to go another juncture, then so be it, right? Um, so that was super interesting. But how do you make decisions? Like what does your process look like for making these uh, fork in the road decisions um obviously a lot of this a, a lot of the times have to do with you what are you competent with if you feel like you're okay. competent you know it's like it's uh if you're competent in um in 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 a, or you have x abilities it's like okay this is more like what i'm gonna find so i better do this uh Obviously, there's there's something that's key, and I always felt like it's key. Is this you know to, to me? I always work hard on the communication skill. To me, that is key. Whether you do one thing or the other. One second, let me see. If I can, if I can turn this on, excuse me. One second, the sun is falling. Way better now. So, <clears throat> the communication skill. If you're good at communicating, obviously it's going to be easier for many things when you're working in your life also. But when you when you're working. 
So being able to communicate. For me, languages were also always really important. And then together, these together with a set of abilities that is like, that's good. I can coach people. I can I can get to know the discipline. In, you know, in, in cycling, for example, if I jump from one discipline to the other, I look at the discipline and I say, like, okay, they're doing this way. Why don't we try it this way? They're doing this way. Why don't we try it that way? A lot of the times you when you see stuff, even in downhill, I mean, and you know, like in the past, I remember like, I don't know if you remember the dropper, dropper seat post story. You know, many things are not being tried before. and People are scared to try or they say like, I'll leave it. It's been always like this. It's not going to change anything. And sometimes I think you don't need to be scared of like trying. It's like, if you have enough, let's say like enough, if you can forecast, it's like, that's going to be good maybe for this, for this, for this. Let's try that. And then you might be the first one, but it's maybe you're opening your way there. So I think this, these two, the abilities and the communication skill, which I always like really pay attention to be as good as, as good as I could. It's what's taking me like to, to, to pick up one, you know, one direction in, in the one, once I got to the junction. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, yeah, good communication skills, just they go so far in life in anything, sport, business, relationships. And um, so you mentioned the road thing. So, you know, people might be learning of you and, and they can hear it's mountain biking and downhill, but you've done a lot of work with um, top road teams and, and you're going to do that now with the, your new news. Um, what's it like on the road side and with what you're working on? Like, What does that look like? Um, I got called the first in 2012. So and 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 I don't, it's it, it was 2012, yes, end of 2012 or let's say late summer 2012. <clears throat> Rabobank Giant. So Rabobank had a, a a road team already for many years. I believe it was like their 13th or 14th season in in the sport, and and then decided to to have uh, they were racing giant bikes uh, back then. I was uh, I was I was working working in Giant, and they decided to. We call this guy because we're having people crashing and having too many injuries. And when they crash, normally they were severe injuries. In downhill, sometimes you you know you heard about broken femur, broken pelvis, and stuff like that. But most of the time, that doesn't happen. Most of the time, for the amount of crashing too. In road cycling, there is a lot of crashing. The volume of crashing is huge. But normally, the people following road cycling. They, you cannot be at every single race. And there is so many races in the calendar, you have to be actually in a race car of a team to actually hear race radio telling like, crash, these two guys from this team, or crash, one guy from this team from the other. We crash, a peloton bump, and they keep informing. And during a stage, you'll be shot on how many people crashes, a lot of the times. So at first, it was like a crashing scene. So I went there, and again, it's like, I got the call and it's like, whoa, okay, let me think about it a second. I, w- I want to make sure I can actually bring something to the table to this instead of like through myself, you know. I always call it like, I'm just going to like, you know, th- through myself or dive into the pool. Uh, let me check if there's water, if the swimming pool is full. <laughs> at least at least half full, you know, half full. <laughs> I'm not going to jump in <laughs> there's no water. So um, I want to say, I already had a couple – friends that they race in the in the peloton in the, in the 90s when i do my road rides back then when i was racing downhill i would go with them and descending they were like you know quite bad i said like, all these people i think they could do better at doing this so then already back then you know riding my road bike i would experiment a few things and because of that already like experience prior together with some of the stuff studying videos and stuff i said like okay i'm just gonna like get probably a set of drills understanding what those guys need, riding with them a little bit. <clears throat> and I make this kind of like this, all this um, sketch, all this diagram. It's like, okay, I need this. I need that. I want to see this and I can bring this and I can bring that for now. And then from there, I started understanding the sport a little bit more. So I brought already. So I, I did a presentation. I explained technique training and why and what can they get out of it and how I, was my plan to actually reinforce that, blah, blah, blah. And that was like a first phase. So I just I just hit the you know the uh, the big meeting room of the Rabobank team back in 2012. 60 plus people, you know, listening to my presentation. And the day after, I like, approved them. Obviously, under the clock at one point, but that's not my first 
step of my first uh, actually goal to you know to do things under the clock. But I you know they could see already like it's like oh okay well this guy's not that crazy. Obviously they had tires to test and it's like how are you gonna test tires on the road? Can you tell me that? It's like well we don't know we need to test. It's like well okay let's figure out how can we test tires on road cycling. And one thing to the other you know, um, twelve years later. I've been with, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess like most, not all of them, but most of the World Tour teams, which has been super interesting because you get to the team and as I said, like when you get to the team, a lot of the times you get to work with people. So you, you kind of go like quite deep into the team. So you understand the way they work, the way, obviously those teams are structures of 120, 150 people sometimes. And you get into their organization and the way they organize, they do logistics, they communicate. You know, that's that's what I see that is progress in downhill because I see how those the, those teams, they do it and they are so professional. And uh, it's been super enriching to get to, to know all of them, to get to know the different cultures in road cycling, if it's more like French or Italians or it's more like, like uh, American, Aussie or Anglo culture of road cycling. So... To me, it's been it's been really amazing. Also, seeing female uh, road cycling really like growing the sport crazy. The evolution of, of uh, women road cycling in the last three years has been it's been huge. Yeah, that's super fascinating because I've ridden down the back of Alpe d'Huez um, as a downhiller on a road bike, and I was actually quite terrifying. Like you obviously have to push, and we weren't even pushing. But there's a few of the turns that I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If I just misjudge it, I was going a little bit too hot. Yeah, there's going to be huge crashes. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think it's free time, as as you know, you know, getting better at downhill and gravity for XC and road. It's kind of a low hanging fruit if you can do it correctly because it's it's free time. Like we spoke, like for them to increase three seconds on a three minute climb is going to take X amount of training and wattage up. You know, like the technicalities of that. And then if you say, okay. I can give you three seconds over a three-minute downhill. You're probably going to be able to get that way quicker. Yes, but it's 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 so much not in the sport. It's you know well, like not in the culture of the sport or what? Not in the culture like of the it's sport. N- yeah, and it's a sport that changes really slow. So at first the when road I was there, side. yeah. So some of the guys after the first meeting, the coach that brought me there, he was a coach that signed for the team, and he came from triathlon. So he was like the coach of John Ferdinand back then. So John Ferdinand just got a silver medal at the Olympics and then they signed him up for the team. And then he had a wider span. He, he, would, he would look at things like a fisheye. He would look a lot more in perspective. He had a lot more vision than the road guys had a very narrow vision of what they were doing. And some of the stuff has been like, it's been done like this always. We don't change it. That's the way it's been done. What are you talking about? And and, and yeah, they are really defensive. Yeah, they're really exactly really classic in that style. So that classic, you know, shape style. We, sometimes you had, you know, it's a it's a it's a thick shell they have, and you have to break in, you know, slowly to actually, you know, get your ideas in. As I said, like the evolution was like first it was like you guys were having accidents or crashes. They still do have. But that was the main concern. Then they were losing races downhilling. Now they're winning races downhilling. So that's a little bit the evolution after 12 years of road cycling. But if you look at the stages, because they say like, oh, you come from downhill mountain bike. You guys are crazy. So many people have told this so many times. Two things. The, the two things I've heard the most. You guys are crazy. And you guys drink beer and you don't need to train. Yeah, and you're not fit. Exactly. And I said, like, yeah. well, you drink beer if you want. I was never, like, a big beer, uh, beer drinker. But you drink beer if you want, but you cannot access that because, obviously, like, it has consequences. Obviously, I mean, it, it's, it, it doesn't go well with, a, with an athlete life. But you're not, you're not crazy. I said, like, you guys are the ones that are crazy because you go on Lycras, you go fast down the hill on a road that you don't know under whatever – uh, uh, I say weather condition, and you go on a bike that is the shittiest bike to descend because yeah. it's everything is stiff back then, no disc brakes yet, and the tires are this thin, and 
On top of that, you do it with an ability that maybe might be not really a very good ability you have for descending, but also you don't work on it. You don't work on that ability. So that made things, to me, was like a, a very clear reading of what was happening. And some of them, there was actually like time and time and time for them to realize. Luckily, nowadays, a lot of them, they do understand that they need to work on, you know, on this area. And and and, and really, the the a lot of the times when they sit down for the season, it's like, okay, we need to do things, this, this, this. And then at the end, what happened this year was like, Look at this crash here, this crash there. You got dropped here. You got dropped again there. You could not help your leader because you were dropped again. It's like you have to work on your skill. So skill is one more thing they need to do and they need to understand and, and, and realize. But the evolution, this brakes, I had the prototype this brake bike, like the first pre-production ones. And you would go to a training camp, obviously, with all these different teams. And every single team will say like, Oscar, that's for all people. That's maybe a grand fondo thing at the most. And I said, like, you guys haven't tried this. But if you try this and you say it's shit, then try this shit thing for a couple of months or even a month because you write every day. And then you go back to your old rim breaks and then you tell me. Yeah. So it's been yeah, this you tell me. with many things, also with the pressure. That was the first thing I, I you know, you touch the tube, tubes pressure, the tubulars. Back then it's like they had nine bars. No discretion on what the weather of the uh, the 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 weight of the rider was, you know, nine bars, and it's like well, this is like these are like rocks, you know. It's like a no traction, zero capacity of absorbing, you know. You're minimizing the grip, yeah, but it rolls faster. Then I realized with wind tunnels and rolling that maybe decreasing the pressure will actually roll faster. It's like well, well there we go. And then instead of like twenty threes, they went twenty threes on with twenty fifth, twenty five, and now they are twenty eights even. So it's 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 been evolving, but it's it's a really slow evolution, with very 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 hard to actually you know uh, convince them to to try things. Very 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 hard. Obviously, they have a, they have a very little time too. Uh, you know, I have to say that that those teams are unbelievably busy. Those people that the huge budget they have, they have three teams in the men. For example, World Tour means like you have three different teams, all times. Same weekend, sometimes they have three different races. The amount yeah. of like personnel going left and right, cars, buses, trucks, it's unbelievable. So I, there's very little team to actually try a uh, uh, time to try stuff and innovate, I would say. It's very little time. But that's back to what you said earlier when you wanted to retire and you wanted to test, because that was my first proposal uh is is I've said it a few times on the podcast was not to race. I could race, but it would be to help develop, say, the younger rider, and maybe test as well because the the races would be busy. And that's maybe where testing in road, which it sounds like you've done in the past, would be critical because those guys are not busy and they're so busy, and then they're so defensive against trying something new. You could like try it, show the data, and then present it, but they sound they sound very stubborn. Um, yes, that's for sure. Um, but you got not, it's, exciting stuff. Yeah, sorry. It, it it's not in the. It's just it's not in the nature of the of the sport and the discipline. You know, it's not in the nature. If you look at the technique of road cycling, it's like what kind of technique you need for road cycling. When you look at mountain bike, the the skill sets, the skill set you need to have is it has to be wide. You know, you have to be like able to wheelie, bunny hop, jump, do these. You know, skid, the traction, control, so many parameters at the same time that makes it riding really good. When you look at road cycling, obviously you need to control a lot of parameters as well, but purely and still is the engine. So a lot of the people get yeah. thrown from one sport to road cycling because, I don't know, maybe it was someone that was a runner, got injured, then he was riding a bike to recover. Then all of a sudden you see like, whoa, this athlete is actually fast on the bike, it's very strong. Let's put him on the lap. They put the rider on the lap and then all of a sudden crazy values. World Tour. It's been like this many times. You get thrown to world tour, and there is obviously there's there is the the, the specificities of road cycling, echelons. You know, it gets hectic on the peloton. There is a lot of things to learn on this side of the technique. But at the end, the riding ability on the bike, and if you want to be like a gymnast, a swimmer, a golfer, any other sport, the technique is really important. In road cycling, it's proven like some. Some some athletes at age 20, 25, they jump into road cycling and they can reach the max level. 
if you jump at age 20, if you want to be at any sport, I don't think you reach the max level at all. It's not possible. No way. No, you know, it's no, like it's way, it's way too late. You have to be perfecting and doing it as a, a, from a young age. Otherwise, you're just not going to make it. Yeah, but look at like someone like Pitcock. I mean, yes, he's this phenom. He's got this crazy engine. But the skill he has on mountain bike transfers in the tour on a descent. Like, he's insane. Well, the little I've seen, like, certainly helps. Yes, the engine is obviously one of, you know, like 80, 90% in road. or Whatever the number is, you would be able to tell me. Um, but it certainly doesn't hurt to try to increase that skill set. If you, let's say, like, if you don't have the engine, it's like you, you, you don't get to the top level. So in downhill, for example, yeah. if you don't get the talent, you don't make it to the top level. Somehow you, you, you'll make it natural. It's a, it's a natural selection. And you'll make it to maybe not the top, top level, but you'll make it to the World Cup level. And once you are into the World Cup level, they're qualifying as a young kid or, or whatever, even if you come to the sport later, then from there you start you know, perfecting and getting better at this. But you get there because you've got that talent. The base, like the, 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 the big mass of the talent, like it, it's the, the core is there. In road cycling, if you don't have, I don't know, not, you know, they, they, they have a few talks a few years ago, it's like threshold power is six watt kilo, for example. This is huge. I mean, if you don't get any closer to these numbers, you can forget about being a world tour athlete, world tour cyclist. Mm. There's no way. Maybe you get to lower divisions, maybe. Uh, but to make it to the top, you need to have the engine. Otherwise, you don't have it. Once you get to the top, everyone is going to have very similar capabilities as yours. The values will be very similar. Obviously, there's different profile riders, a puncher and, you know, an all-rounder. They have a sprinter. They have the climber. They have a classics. All these different profiles. But within the profiles, everyone will be very, very similar. And there is where you actually, like I say, like you need to become an architect. You need to become an architect of your of you profile. You need to understand where would be the balance if there is if you if you if you are an architect you don't build something that is balanced your building is going to crumble you're going to make something that is balanced all the areas look at what i'm doing here nutrition is going well i'm resting i'm residing in a good place i'm doing this i'm doing training over here and preparing for that over there all this balance is what i going to push you to get your maximum performance otherwise it's you know it's you know you you won't you won't make it and yes pitcock obviously transfer a lot of the skill he's gotten off-roading because he spends time in the dirt and that as i said like get transferred most of it i mean probably it, i would say even like 100 percent can transfer to road cycling and he obviously he yeah. uses it and he benefits huge from it i mean it's i mean to the level of those guys when he wins a strata bianca this past year he opens a gap in a descent that it's obviously steep it's gravelly and he opens a gap of like five six seconds in 500 meters so that six seconds, obviously, though, those guys on the back are chasing, but they are talking. It's like, oh, you're pulling, I'm pulling, you're pulling. I'm pu-. In the meantime, Pitcock is like, is it going forward? And then he's like, if I'm not sure, it's like roughly approximately 40 kilometers. So he gets on the 40 kilometers time trial and he wins the event. Where does the gap open? In a small descent of 500 meters. So sometimes it can be, I'm not saying like it, it, it's the most important, but it can be so crucial sometimes. It can be so determinant. That I think it's open a few a few uh, people mind you know like it's the ability of those riders Mohoric in Milan San Remo you look at many of these guys it's like you see they've won a stage sometimes because they have the ability of the riding not only the legs yeah it makes a lot of, it makes so much sense and uh, that's why I think your job is so important and when we were giant it was it was awesome. It was just like having a second set of eyes and, and someone like you say, you go to the sports psychologist to just confirm certain things and we could confirm lines or we could you could spot the blind spots and say, yeah, you feel that way, but this is actually what I'm seeing. Try this. And uh, you've got some exciting news, though. You, you, you're you moving on uh, from Giant uh, and you're mm-hmm. going to the XC side with Trek, correct? Yes. Um, and that you're going to work with someone that you probably worked with from quite early on is Yolanda Neff. Um, yes. I remember the work you did with her and, and how much it's paid off on the yeah. descents. Yeah. Oh, by the way, she is crazy though. Like down is not crazy. Yolanda Neff on the XC yeah. side, pretty sure yeah. she's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you compare to the, to, the, to the XC, uh, let's say like the average profile of an XC rider. So she... Yeah. She takes it's it pretty crazy fine. on the downhills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She likes to really like, she's, 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 she likes to push that, that limit. 
she feels comfortable with the speed. She likes the speed. She likes pushing that limit. And, and normally you don't see that in a discipline like cross country so much. They think a lot more yes. on the side of like the risks and the consequences and all this instead of like, you know, let's 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 push this. Let's see where I can push my limits. Well, if when they go up the hill, I really push the limits. You know, they really like, they really like, you know, they, they can suffer and they they like to push themselves. They like, you know, they, they probably even enjoy to be like in pain, but it's something like it's normal for them. Well, in downhill or in descending and cornering in general, they uh, say like the threshold of the fear in downhill is like up, up, up here and then cross country normal is like way, way, way lower. Um, so the, the, a little bit the change came and again, like it's like one of these things in life at the, the junction. I was, uh, you know, been for giant coaching, you know, 14 years with them, 14 years coaching, uh, you know, with giant. Then, uh, you know, at one point, obviously, I always felt comfortable. They gave me the opportunity at first. I think I've been always, you know, uh, uh, working with them really nice. Um, but at one point, it's like there's new project. And uh, and for me, to be like a freelance on the road cycling was always like very interesting. But at the same time, it was, was getting really busy. And I felt I was not going deep enough. So I would work with a few athletes for a few days. And then we would repeat after a few months, sometimes even after a year. And I never get to work deep like I did work with downhill and uh, and cross country. So I said, like, okay, let's, let, I mean, I want to do this. So I got the opportunity to explain the road team what was my vision to work with the guys. And then they said, like, man, Oscar, like, this this sounds really good. Uh, we would like to think about this idea you've got. And I said, like, look, you know, I've thrown this. Let's see, let's see what, what what's what's going to happen. So after a few months, we talked about it again and we talked about it again. And at the end, it's like, okay, Oscar, I think we, we're getting ready for the roadside to step this and make that step you're asking. We've got the off-road as well. So you think we can make a package? You think we can, you know, be with us a little bit? And I say like, yeah, absolutely. Let's make, let's make this package. So for me, it was the opportunity basically, you know, in short, it was like the unifying, finally unifying all those road years into one team also in the same brand as the mountain biking. So under the same umbrella, now I have mountain biking and road cycling. Unfortunately, I have to, uh, you know, I have to like step on the side on the downhill, uh, on the, on, on the downhill racing because it's not compatible. I mean, the schedule this year has been the same, same time as like a training is happening on the downhill course as a training on the cross country course and vice versa. So, so it's not possible. Opportunity was like this now. I took it the way it came. And, uh, so yeah, I decided to, I decided to, to change. And yeah, as I said before, you know, no, no, uh, so it's like no, uh, not much time on the transferring a little bit. Yeah. You know, you obviously, your left, this is not a little, it was a little bit like racing, you know, living after so many years, but obviously here you leave people that you've been working, people that you've been creating a close relationship, like a friendship. And obviously you can still be friends, but now you're changing the boat, you're going somewhere else. And, uh, and uh, yeah, excited, excited for the future. Let's see, let's see what that brings. We, the season has been already started. We did a couple of road uh, camps already, mountain bike. We did the first camp and, uh, and yeah, hands on the project, you know, full gas. Congrats, man. No, it's awesome. And like you say, it's something you've had in your mind that you think was not getting done correctly or you couldn't deep dive them enough and add enough value. So it'll be super interesting to hear um, how it goes working with the road team like intensively. And uh, we'll probably cross paths because you're coming on a training camp in uh, South Africa uh, yes. pretty pretty shortly here just yeah. after we recorded this and you might have already done it by the time this gets released so uh, we'll cross paths again and you'll get to see Stellenbosch again uh, it's been yes. a long time long since time. you guys raced downhill there and probably uh, helped uh, the economy in the bars after the race back in back before it was quite super professional so uh that should be super fun for you, but I cannot let you go. I think we can wind down. You give me a lot of your time, and I know you've got to get ready for this trip. Can you walk me through the mechanic you had? Um, I hope you remember the story because I've told it a lot, so I hope I've got it right. Is what he told you on like a semi-final day to get you 
ready and then what he told you on the final day to motivate you to go fast. Do you, you remember the story I'm talking about? No, no. The top of the it. hill, your mechanic. I, I hope it was you where he said today, Oscar, no die. And then it came oh. final time and he said, Oscar, today you can die, meaning you need to go full gas. Yes, yes, yes. Like was, in yeah. his broken English. Yes, that was uh, Santi was my uh, my last year mechanic. So I um, he, was, he was a guy that did bike trials. And he had this year was he was like not a sabbatic year, but he was on university, but he was taking things easy. And I said like, hey, what about mechanic? And then obviously as a trials guy, you also like, you know, tinker your bike. And, and he was okay. It's like, look, it's very easy. You only have a bike to work on. You kind of like uh, put all the parts, you build the bike, and then you actually like put the parts off the bike again, the frame on and off, on and off all the time, and you get better at this. So we did some work, and then he would come with me. And then he would go for semifinals and it's like, okay, today, Oscar, you cannot die. He said, today, <laughs> you cannot die. You don't die today. And Maybe you like look at him like, what did you think? Yeah, many semifinals. It's like, okay, you have to push, but, you know, leave something, leave something for the day after, which is not really like the case. I think most of the times what makes you faster in final is like you push hard in semifinals and then you learn something that you can actually, that feedback goes on to the day after, hopefully. New information, you're like, well, I could do this better than this other, and you can incorporate something new that makes you faster. Unless you go real fast, which you always go. But he meant like today the goal is to pass on to the finals. Obviously, you have to get maximum points. And then when he was at the finals, we were warming up. It's like, Oscar, today you can die. <laughs> he said like, today you can die. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, it's like you know, today you can really like push it hard. You know, like you have to risk it at all consequences. If, you, if it goes bad, it goes bad. You know, it's like if, it, if, it, if you push it a little bit too far, you know, maybe you don't get the result you want, or maybe maybe you end up crashing or something. But you really like to push, push hard. So, um, it I mean it, it it helped a little bit to me because it's obviously it's, it's, I mean I mean look at how how I mean how uh, you know how simple and if you want how damn or how how stupid the sequence or the the phrase is, but it's like today you can die. It's like now at this point now is when you need to give your all everything. And then we will see what comes out of it. If you have performed well, that's one thing. And then maybe you also achieve the result because some of the people think like only great work, good work is going to lead to winning or results. And that's not true. There's a lot of things in between just before you get the results where you have to understand the competition game. But, you know, he said like, okay, up until here, everything has gone right. Now you can die. It means like <laughs> it's time to go now. <laughs> No, and it's like kind not, of funny, right? So you may be like a lighthearted at the top, you kind of probably laugh at the way he said, and you're like, but he's right. Yes, he's, he's right. right. He's right. But he would say like, he would, he would say, th say things like, like really direct, obviously translate from Spanish. Yeah, like his English translate, he was always directly translated. Yes. It would sound super funny in English. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're but like, yeah, I, I know that, my man. I know yeah. that. Yeah, and he would, he would, do he you would be... This this, no this this person sometimes that is the confidence person that is the mechanic or the coach that goes up with the athlete and I think is that is where you know the athlete well that is where that that kind of like the this competition work that you've done is where it comes to the the pinnacle the the the, the maximum tension is before the start and how you communicate to your rider how, what vocabulary using and what kind of like conversation you would have to actually leave the athlete in the best spot to actually perform so it's yeah, yeah. that's that's an art it's an important that, it's an important that, person that person that stays it's with you so important yeah so important speaking of important person um i'm not sure why but you were at the top with me i don't know where the mechanic was that race in val de sol do you remember Speaking of translating from Spanish, so you had a joke in Spanish and you translated to English and you wanted to keep my mind off the seri seriousness of the race after a really good quali. So you start telling this joke. Now, I know exactly what you're doing. You're trying to keep my mind off the race, trying to keep it lighthearted because that's what I needed. You, you learned me what I yeah. needed, what level of pressure. And so this was great. But eventually I had to stop you because the joke was taking so long and I knew my warm up was about to finish. Do you remember the joke? With the two uh, elderly couple on holiday having a skinny dip. I don't remember the joke, but I remember because I know that if you got distracted, 
So if you got distracted at certain point, for you it was acceptable. Like it's like, okay, pa, 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 I'm just getting distracted. I can, I don't know, we would talk things or I would actually try to like, you know, I, I'm really bad at jokes. I don't remember ever one, but it's like, you know, you get this joke and, and, and then to a certain point, to a center extension, I know that if I push too far, then you knew you had to go to the gate and then really get ready. So a lot of the times it was like, I'm going to push him to the very end, not to actually mask. Yeah. Because some people are trying to mask the reality, which is like, yes. we are stressing up here. And it's like, yeah. I wanted to also sometimes a lot of the, a lot of the times make you realize, like, it's like we are masking and by masking it, to a certain point, it's bringing even more stress than what reality is. So yes, I true. think that at one point, and and I always tell, and I've used you, Andrew, some of some of the time for an example. It's like Andrew was someone that's had this talent to do well. He did well in many races in his career, and then he had this part which he wasn't that good, but he would you could get Andrew's head and drown it under the water because he would go for it. So it's meaning meaning like you would go through the face. You know, and you will you will actually face that that kind of like that stress part. Some days better than others, and I think what what a lot of the times was my goal coaching you was like, Andrew, we can mask it, but the, this is the reality. We are here, and now you can die. You know what I'm saying? We're here, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. now it's the time to go. So you can mask it, but it's like let's see, let's see what we need to understand and how you can actually go to actually like set a few challenges that you. Let's hit these challenges because you know that many times, Andrew, you had this capacity to either you were actually like looking for like the safe run that gets you to the decent result or you would do like the maths on the points and stuff like that. A lot of people does it, but yeah, ultimately it's like, I start to perform the best here. I start to like do this and, and you would not escape this phase. Some of the athletes, they get to this point and then they're like, you cannot, you know, they are they are like fish. They are like catching fish. You cannot catch them. They don't want to get to this point. You went to this point. You didn't like this point. You didn't manage well that point, but I could grab you. So we could work on that thing. And some days were good. Some days were not as good, but you know, you, you would really like put yourself in the position where it's like, I want to go through this. I want to go through this. So that's some of the time that that time was like, you see, you're trying to mask, you're trying to tell a joke. And at one point it's like, that it doesn't really work because this is where yeah the i literally is. said to you i'm like we're good dude i appreciate yeah. it but we're gonna go race now it's like it's exactly. a good i'm a good mood yeah. yeah but um no you're right and i mean listening to probably some of what you've said and learning yeah like a lot of me wants to turn back time with this new information and see if i could deal with it even better and uh, sometimes i feel hard on myself oh yeah like i compare myself to greg and the way he deals with things and i go well, if, if you look at the results, clearly I wasn't a choker, you know, like I performed predominantly at all the races. There were some that didn't go my way or I maybe didn't manage the things and I crashed. So, but you learn from them. But what I'm learning now is, yeah, you need to face it. Like you can't switch off the thoughts and switch off the pressure. You have to accept it. Whether that I've heard some uh, golf psychologists and stuff, they're like, uh, Bob's back. So Bob's his alter ego that gets nervous. Yeah, you know, fuck, Bob's back. Okay, well, screw you, Bob. Like, I know you're back, but this is now the reality. And then you have to find, for me, what started helping is a process. It's okay, I focus on the first turn. I focus on something I know I can do or something like that. Um, and that's what we learned well. But um, yeah, it brings back good memories, Oscar. You've given me so much of your time. Uh, good luck with it. I hope to cross paths. I luckily will now in South Africa. But uh, yes, I'll definitely sure, follow sure. along. Surely be there. Um, yeah, with the Swiss squad, we have a training camp. And then after that, like it will be time to actually jump onto the little track, which is the uh, new sponsor that the road team is having. And then uh, on the cross country side of things will be like uh, track factory racing. It has been for many, many years. So I'll be like, you know, jumping back and forth. Uh, uh, around these projects that I have, you know, so, so there's three um, open fronts and then, uh, and then let's see, but you know how the season goes. So as soon as like, you know, kick off the season, it's, 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 uh, it's going to be crazy. February is already crazy. March is a little bit easier. April will be on tangled up in the uh, world cup season. So 
Yeah, excited to come over to South Africa and see Stellenbosch after 25 years or 26. Awesome, man. And they can follow along. You're not maybe the biggest social media guy, but it's Oscar Size Coaching Cycling or what on Instagram? Oscar Size Cycling, I believe. Yeah, I'm not really a media guy. I don't do a good job of this at all. I'm, <laughs> I have to get better. But... No, I, I think it's because you're so humble. I, I see you're a guy that has helped people's career. And if you look at your website and all the testimonials, and I've spoken to a lot of riders, how much you've helped. So, uh, dude, awesome job what you're doing. It's You really are giving back to the sport in a serious way. And uh, till the till the next chat, dude, you you must uh, stay well. We'll see thank you, you soon. Thank, thank you very much. And I have something for you. If you know, because sometimes I feel like on the social media, I don't have – it's like who's going to be interested in what I have to say, what I have to tell, you know what I'm saying? So if you think that it's something interesting I can post in social media, you'll tell me because you are a lot better than I do. I'll have a think and uh, we'll make some teasers of this. No, this I've, when you saw me scribbling, that's all my notes to try get some teasers of just all the value and information you've said. Uh, I definitely think we could share some ideas, but um, to the rest of you out there, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you follow the show. Um, you'll be super surprised at uh, how many people are listening to the show, but maybe they don't click that follow or subscribe button. And then we are on YouTube. So uh, make sure you go to Moving the Needle podcast on YouTube. Give us some love there if you've got uh, some value out of this. I know I did. Till the next one, peace.